bitching about hit record. Oh, <laughs> well, 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 I re hit well, record, so. Go at 10 seconds and 15 seconds. 10, Wait, hold on. 15. I'm not on time. Dot is. Oh, you my God. You got, oh, you got God. seven seconds. Okay, 10, 10. <clears throat> Those okay. are good. Those are good claps on my end. I'm proud of my claps. I I had one a real loud one. My first one was. Whew. Let's see what's today. Does, does Karen ever comment on the claps? Or no. Does she just learn to accept it. Uh, yeah, no, she doesn't say anything. Uh, right. Let's see. It's amazing how a little tomorrow can make up for a whole lot of yesterday. John oh. Guare? Guar? I don't Where? know who that is. I'm googling him. <laughs> oh yeah. E U A R E. Playwright. Oh yeah, oh. John Guare. Nah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Nah. Nah. laughs> the playwright. Who does this guy think he is? Bill Shakespeare. Could be worse. Oh, it could yeah. be John Patrick Shanley. That's a deep cut. Yeah. <laughs> I I did uh, act. It's a weird podcast. I know. Yeah, it is. I don't. I mean, I'm happy about it, but it's. I I don't. I don't. I don't know who uh, I have not seen any of this person. Would you place. say I don't know him? That's my purse. I don't know you. Yeah, that's the reference that was going for. It, it is actually the reference that I was going okay. for. Yeah, I knew that only Andre would pick up <laughs> that quickly. Oh, I love King of the Hill. Anyways, who doesn't? <laughs> Great. King of the Hill was Family Guy before Family Guy. We didn't need Family Guy because we had King of the Hill all along. Family or King of the Hill could heal this nation or yes. that nation that I'm not yes. in. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's I, all. I feel so, so such a kinship with Bobby Hill. Yeah, all how long time. until Bobby Hill can be president? Right, <laughs> he's probably legally never because get, he's there. perpetually he's perpetually. Uh, like he doesn't 13. age. Okay. I saw a thread uh, dangerously uh, getting long on the tooth here, but uh, I saw a thread <laughs> earlier. <laughs> like this week last week about how the simpsons like became like weirdly aspirational and like out of touch with like how homer is like a high school like dropout with like a well-paying job and can afford a house for like three kids on a single income yep and stuff like that yeah and that's why it got less good it got yeah, less good that was when... that was kind that's... of the thesis of the thread yeah that's among the reasons yeah. Yeah, I'm on the research. All right. King so of the Hill. Before Always we start, good. I was going to put this in news and I was also going to bring it up on the show, but I don't think there's any place for it. Ring Fit Adventure is currently on sale for 13% off, which makes it $69. Nice. nice. Yeah. Okay. Nintendo will remember that. <laughs> no, they won't. <laughs> they're going to they're going to patch it out like they patched out Minecraft Steve's dick. Sad. that's not really how that went but that's that's what happened they his dick was on the game they're like we gotta we gotta remove that all right uh <clears throat> hello and welcome to episode 145 of the gaming fix podcast on this halloween october 31st 2020 I am your very spooky host, Andre Cole, a.k.a. your partner's favorite ghoul. I'm joined today by Pat. I have a favorite ghoul now. Is it Andre? No, it's the ghoul from Amnesia Rebirth. Oh. Which is... Alex. It's a uh, ghoul. I am your partner's favorite gourd. Okay. That's probably a butter okay, squash. Yeah. Is that pumpkin butt? Uh, Allison. <laughs> no, I'm not saying Allison has a pumpkin butt. Like, there was the picture of the guy with the pumpkin butt, the pumpkin head, like, climbing over a fence. Did y'all see that? Uh, no. No. No, I didn't. I have no idea what that means. Is that, like, this, the, 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 the suit? The, the guy, the person in the suit that does the dance? For... No. Okay. No, this was like a person in like a pumpkin patch in like jeans, but their ass was like a two pumpkins. I I don't know. Well, so that's, that's not that's not my ass. So sorry. 
Um, <laughs> my favorite ghoul is uh, the special Scooby Doo and the Ghoul School. I don't know if you've yes. seen that, oh, but yeah. that there was a big childhood favorite. So we can get through the intros, and then I want to go back to that for just a second. And our last member joining us all the way from spooky Transylvania, <laughs> Jeff Davis. I have such sights to show you. Oh, that's the spookiest. <laughs> uh, uh, my, favorite, my favorite ghoul. Uh, uh, I always preferred being a ghoul to a Malkavian uh, rather go. than a Ventru. That's good. Yeah, very good. 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 Uh, I'm going to replay that one. Well, I shouldn't say that game because, but I want to replay Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines mm -hmm. soon. Even though the That's sequel one of, got delayed? Yeah, yeah. Not even because of the sequel, just because I actually am, my expectations of the sequel are kind of low. Mm -hmm. I hope that they are blown away, but um, I'm not setting my hopes too high. I think Bloodlines is probably one of the best games ever made. So, yeah, really good. Um, on, on the list, like top 20, probably. In, somewhere in there uh so i would just like God. to play it again because it's pat, one of my faves pat you shared this pumpkin dance video and i had somehow allowed my mind to just let this seep out and it i thought it was gone no it never but, goes it's yeah, best it's, it's, it's one of the best things about the halloween season is that you can back. you can watch the pumpkin dance yep. if if you want another halloweeny kind of music -y video i recommend vampira by devon townsend sure yes mm -hmm. also that's really good. good that's good um I'm trying to find this pumpkin ass but so uh, i go ahead and talk about scooby-doo and the ghoul school so well no it's just i said last <laughs> week we i said that i would totally do a podcast where we watch an episode of scooby-doo and then do like a 20 minute like tear down of the episode and the more i, I can't stop thinking about that okay you didn't <laughs> just say that thinking about when i was here week. but i would 100 percent do that podcast I, I think i said it in our chat Oh, no, I didn't we see talked it about it either on the way. Podcast. We talked about yeah, it on okay. the show, I think. I am like... I didn't see I am, it, but that that is a good idea. If, if the, the new year is a good time to start new podcasts, if it's still stuck in my head in two months or in a, a, a yeah, two months, then we'll, I'll revisit that because Scooby-Doo is one of my favorite shows ever. And yeah, that's, there's just, it's a verdant field to go through every Scooby-Doo episode because there's like... <laughs> Has a lot shit load of them. Have any of us watched Scoob? What's... No, I haven't watched a lot of the brand new stuff, like the 2020 movie. No, no. no. Okay. Oh, like oh no. Is that the live I action one? I saw the trailer for it. Like, no, uh, it's like no, it's, no, it's, it's like CG. CG animated. No. Yeah, weird. And they're like children, like young. I don't I like. We went over this last week. This is a retread, but I don't like when they're young. <laughs> this is like well, they're like. Uh, like early they're like young adults not Look, like children let's 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 lay it on the table one of the best things about scooby-doo is the weird latent sexual tension that exists between all of the members of that cast <laughs> because there was it, it, it's palpable in the original uh scooby-doo and so when you make them children it suddenly removes one of the good aspects of the show <laughs> okay and I've not watched it since I was a kid, so I did not pick up on these things. So I'd be interested to rewatch oh, some they, of those episodes I mean, and be like, hmm. They, they I mean, a... like, absolutely, like, uh, Daphne and Fred and have Daphne are the main and the core of yeah. that. But I think but, there's a Shaggy Velma connection there I and a Velma Daphne. Velma is actually. Now, everybody's firm. into v Daphne and Velma now. And I'm but... not into it for the, like, it's, I'm not, I don't need to see anything. I'm not, this isn't like. I'm not like we have to go deeper or anything. I'm just here for the relationships. That's all. Oh my god! So this uh, episode, July thirteenth, twenty twenty, Velma from Scooby Doo is a lesbian and was supposed to yeah. be explicitly gay, gay in the O2 movie. Cool. So I'm gonna Jeopardy style. This episode received episode received critical acclaim. Got five out of fives. It is destined to become an instant classic. I didn't know that there was a Scooby Doo crossover with Supernatural. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What Scooby Doo crossovers? They do with crossovers with like yeah. everything. Uh, in, tw I mean, yeah, in 2018, just... with Supernatural. The new, the thing that people don't know about Scooby Doo is that it never oh. stopped being pretty good. Yeah. Like it's been uh -huh. at a baseline level of quality forever. Um, like even I can admit that, yeah, like the 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 
uh, young Scooby Doo or whatever. A pup that, named Scooby Doo. Pup named, thank you. Please. A pup named Scooby Doo. See, this <laughs> put is how some respect, respect I have. on that dog's name. Um, but it's a good show, even if if I don't like it as much as the original or what came after. What's new Scooby Doo? Great. It's very good. Scooby-Doo. That's a really good theme song too. And WWE. I don't want to. I don't want to insert myself into this. Oh, like, where, if I'm not oh, welcome, but at the same time, like, I if if this podcast is going to be a thing. Uh-huh. Uh, I may have some <laughs> thoughts about Scooby Doo in general because so, I think it's a crunchy text. Yes. Uh, to really unpack. Plus, uh, Mystery Incorporated uh, on the second season uh, has an episode called Stand and Deliver, and they do a Twin Peaks homage. Yes, and... I've seen that one. God. <laughs> it's, very, it's yes. Um, so, okay, my idea for the yeah. show would have been like probably three people at a time and rotate the guests around and have mm-hmm. different guests every week. So anyway, we'll see. Yeah, so yeah, stay tuned for there was Scoob- a, the, this sounds amazing. There was a Lego Scooby-Doo. The oh, only, of course there oh, was. Yeah. The only issue with it is it's already <laughs> a lot of like, there's a, there's, there is a degree of labor to getting people's schedules together to, to record a podcast. So to do a 20 minute episode feels yeah. like you spend a half an hour to an hour getting everybody together and then bullshitting before the podcast and then 20 minutes recording. See, it. That's, that's why you record like, um, seven episodes contiguously. Yeah. But I yeah, yeah. wanted to rotate the guests and that's how uh, true. No, but Trump I mean, content, if you, you, know. you don't have to do them all, you don't, you just, you don't have to release them all in a row. You can, yeah. uh, without going too deep podcasting is going to become part of my job in 2020 2021 so i'm going to have to get better at scheduling and programming so maybe i'll put those skills to use with the more fun podcast more fun than this one no (laughs) hey there's nothing (laughs) there is nothing more fun than scooby-doo yeah you can take that to the bank yeah you might be right certainly not (laughs) any of the video games that we've brought Hey. Any- this week. <laughs> Why yeah. are we you so know, pessimistic? You know, as, you know what's not as fun as Scooby Doo? <laughs> Pokemon Sword and Shield. Okay, okay. I, somehow, I knew that you guys were going to go there, and I was like. <laughs> Allison, I think Pokemon Sword and Shield is probably better than Watch Dogs Legion. Uh, so I'll, I'll say that. Okay, well, I guess then. I, I don't know. I've been, I've been going back and forth of like, do I need to play Watch Dogs Legion or not? But It's not terrible. We'll talk about Watch Dogs okay, Legion when okay. I get up. But it's, it's, we talk about Pokemon. It's because uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield, I'm back on my bullshit um, because the new uh, expansion uh, for Sword and Shield, um, the Crown Tundra, is out. Uh, so I've been playing that, uh, and then I'm also back on my shiny hunting bullshit. Um, so anyway, uh, Crown Tundra, it is the new area. It's a lot bigger than the Isle of Armor, which is the first expansion area and uh, the way i've described crown tundra to a lot of people and i stand by it is that basically as an expansion it's uh oops all legendaries um so basically one of the, the first things the first things that you run into is you um you run into a character who is try like who's traveled there to that area to like see a bunch of uh different uh legendary pokemon so you're you're basically joining him on this adventure to like see a bunch of shi- of not shiny of legendary pokemon um but uh including the new pokemon uh calyrex who's the new sh- legendary to this uh um expansion and then there's also a bunch of old legendaries and i think they've brought back every single legendary that you can get either through the uh, main stuff or through the new Dynamax adventures, which is vaguely, I've described it as kind of like a Pokemon roguelike in a weird huh. way, because basically um, it's it's doing a bunch, uh, it's a bunch of Dynamax battles in a row. So it's it's pretty simplistic as a mode, but you get a rented Pokemon at the start of this and you choose which path that you go down to and each path has a different typing assigned to it, which uh, basically then shows, hey, you can catch a Pokemon with a dark type in this path or you can catch a Pokemon with a psychic type in this path. Um, And you can choose to either 
take that Pokemon with you or to keep using your original Pokemon. Um, with one Pokemon at the way, way end that you know the type for, and that is um, guaranteed to be a legendary. So it's, 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 it's definitely, it's pretty simplistic. Like when I say Pokemon roguelike, it's like, this is a pretty short mode. It's you're very much just choosing these paths and there's very, there's very little to it, but it's kind of an, it's an, I think the most interesting use of the Dynamax battle uh, or the raid battles. So um, I'd say that it's, it's, it's interesting. And now, uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's definitely interesting and you're guaranteed to get a bunch of different legendary Pokemon, which is, feels a little bit overpowered, but at the same time, this is like end game content at this point. So yeah, doesn't uh, everything start at like level 70, like uh, everything you're facing? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, but at the, the same time, this is all of, basically end game. Yeah. The end game of like sword and shield was like in the late sixties. So yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, mm. there's a lot, uh, there, there's a lot of content in here. It's definitely bigger than the, Isle of Armor, um, and there's and there's different ways that you can find these legendaries too. Because um, the one of the things that's back is the uh, um, uh, the legendary birds, so Zapdos, Moltres, and Articuno. But then there's new mm. uh, new forms for the for the region and do you, any of you guys remember how uh, you found the uh, roaming legendaries in gold worked. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Because this is basically yeah. that. They um, show up on the mini map and you go over to where they are, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. This is basically that where you know uh, where, like, what wild area each of them are wandering around in. And you basically have to, like, chase them down. Um, cool. But, uh, but then there's uh, the, uh, the, do you have to read any braille to like get some legendaries? Uh, there's the uh, Regirock, Regice, and Registeel. Yeah, do you have and to they read have, braille like, to get them? No, you don't have to read braille, but you have like, there's like many kind of mini puzzles that you have to do. So it's like, okay. um, I, I don't want to necessarily spoil them, but they're like pretty, they're pretty basic uh, puzzles that you do too. Uh, basically, you have to find these. Uh, ruins that they're in um do a little mini puzzle to get in and then and then you can catch them so um yeah so there's there's a, a bunch of different uh things and i think that there's even more stuff once you uh once you find all of the main legendaries in the uh, campaign so I'm, i guess I have, I have plenty more to uh go but it's it's uh i think it's a really good uh expansion honestly um and some of the most fun i've had with uh sword and shield so um if if you got the expansion and you know kind of played around with isle of armor i, I think like i i didn't dislike the isle of armor but i think this is definitely better and uh and a fun way to get back in the game and now but I also just kind of fucked off and went shiny hunting for a little bit. So to get and I don't have a shiny yet, but someday, someday you will. You'll, you'll get that Wooloo. Someday I'll get that Wooloo. I took a break so that I could uh, shiny hunt um, or shiny uh, breed uh, for uh, what was I? What was I even breeding for? Um, can't even remember okay. the Pokemon you're breeding. This is sick. This is <laughs> this is degenerate behavior. With your there, rented I don't even Pokemon. Care about the Pokemon, all you care about is the payoff. They're going to Pokemon Honestly, Blockbuster. Yeah. I mean, like, let's be Pokemon real. Pokemon Mill over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, no, that's what I was thinking about. It's like, uh, like God. what happens when you like release all of the Pokemon into the wild, and you're like, oh, well, here's. 400 of them these, these domesticated pokemon that you're releasing back into the wild yeah, exactly it's yeah. the, it's a bad scene it's a bad it scene. is 
uh yeah so, no it is not great but at the you, same time i'm like uh are, are you at least spaying and neutering them before you release them back into the world um oh, oh i'm working in grookey right now uh and so it's basically yeah. already yes <laughs> Because so, people don't like Grookey is what I'm saying. Oh, yes, hey, of course. you shut your hey, mouth. Grookey is a good Pokemon. And, <laughs> I didn't uh, say I, me. I, I will have I will a shiny, throw hands. but I have so far bred. Let's see if I can f quickly find it. I have several box. I have a lot of boxes of Grookeys <laughs> right now. Oh, no. Um, let's see. I have mm, boxes, Grookey. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, not uh, almost nine full boxes. Purely of Grookey? Of, only of Grookey. Only oh of my. like my leftover Grookey. Oh, God. Oh, that God. are like, leftover. that are like, that are like, I, I gotta, I, I'm gonna release all of them because I don't need this many Grookey. This just is gonna unleash a swarm, a swarm of all green Grookey. monkeys. What does Grookey eat? That's going to devastate the environment of the Yeah, party. I don't know, man. No, Wait, because Grookey can grow plants. So the wild area. Yeah. So grow some more like trees and shit. Okay, so the what is it what is it called Crown Tundra? What mm -hmm. area what area of the UK is this effect simile for? I fucking don't know cuz it's, it's in the Scotland? south, but it's also the but, coldest. Yeah, but so... like isn't isn't the island like, like flipped Australia. upside down? Like basically Yeah, okay. Europe. So then it so, would be like Scotland kind or something. Scotland so, so you're releasing a bunch of fucking like green monkeys on Scotland. Right now, I'm not in the Crown Tundra area because oh, okay. I like because of <laughs> when I'm breeding them, I have to be near the daycare. So I'm <laughs> well, <laughs> so make these poor daycare employees take care of. Well, also like my starter Pokemon, my starter Reloom <laughs> is uh, having a good 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 time with that ditto. So, yeah. so e ECE really stands for Early Chimchar Education. <laughs> Mate and release. So, uh, <laughs> someday I will have star. I will have shinies. I really want yeah. a shiny Lulu. Uh, Put them on Craigslist when you're trying to get rid of them. I can't. Well, I, I I've gotten to the point where uh, there is no value in in a. <laughs> Grookey anymore because no. wow. there's so many oh, of them. <laughs> this is this is getting weird. Escalating. Let's so let's commodify them. Who, I want to who like doesn't know Pokemon very well. Like yeah. uh, the, the Pokemon player in the household is my partner Lynn, and mm. uh, I occasionally uh, I find details about Pokemon that are deeply uh, upsetting. And, yeah. <laughs> and this Calyrex fellow. Oh yeah. Oh, Calyrex is like fucking wild. Where see basically the, he see the weird dad. Huh? Like, is Calyrex the he... weird dad? No, 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 oh. no. He's the new um, legendary. Oh. Okay. And it's a fun story. And I think that the the one of the things that's really good about this expansion is that, uh, or about this particular one, is that the there's a lot of humor and there's a lot of like interesting storytelling. But Calyrex basically. Uh, is um taking over the body of the dude that you hang out with so basically like possesses the dude and he's just like he's just like trying to communicate with you and he's Sick. like fuck it i'm just gonna possess this dude because i uh like that way i can talk to you through through him whatever you too didn't need to possess nobody to talk to ad <laughs> what well, else that's true casual pokemon calyrex I'll I'll say I think one of the things that I think is really cool about um, the uh, the uh, oh Jesus, Sean Connery died. Oh yeah. yeah. Huh? Uh, yeah. I, sorry, I, that was Andy. one of those things that I saw just now, and it I couldn't keep it in. Uh, that's really sad. Um, anyway, I think it's interesting that the Pokemon are gods in in the legendaries are gods oh in, some yeah some of them are like basically i forget i forget which one is like created time and space but you're like maybe like a 10 year old shouldn't be holding like catch catching that like maybe <laughs> like, maybe, just, maybe a, a, a uh, kid doesn't need to uh but... catch that catch that pokemon it just hey, at least you, it's when... not like other jrpgs where you kill god you just capture god in a tiny ball and keep and them you... on place although or the could thing have been that was to never be seen again and the just thing... fill them that... surround them with grookey 
the thing that vaguely amused me was like when I was having a particular uh, time of trying to go for my shiny Wulu was mm -hmm. uh, having my uh, Pokemon at the front uh, be uh, Eternatus, who is like the big like going to destroy the world at the end of uh, at, in Sword and Shield, but then you catch it. And I'm like, man, th th I'm freaking out with these fucking Wulu if, I, if I'm like, hey, here's this thing that was going to destroy the entire world, and I, now I'm just have it. Uh, but hey, you... Level two you, Wulu. You normal yeah, exactly. Wulu. You're nothing like, to me. <laughs> I don't even I care about you. I will destroy you with, the, with this Eternatus, but yeah. So back to this, like, demonic possession... It, yeah. I, I just like picturing it. All I can think is like the Harbinger from Mass Effect, and like how it possesses the Collector. You know, and everyone's like, "Oh, the, the Collector is like this guy. This Harbinger is terrifying." But no, it's just a normal Collector. I wonder if like something you're gonna get a similar reveal, and it's gonna turn into some like Eldritch Horror game at some point. I don't know. It's very like it's played off very much for laugh, like laughs where he's just like, the, 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 this guy is like, oh boy, I, why why was I sleeping outside? This is weird. And you're just like, dude, you were fucking like possessed for the past however long. It's this is a little strange. Can I read a little bit of the Pokedex for Calyrex? Because this is the thing that jumped out to me. Please, uh -huh. go for it. Uh. This Pokemon ruled all of Galar in ancient times. Yep. Though it appears delicate and slight, its every move is filled with grace and dignity. Concern point, it also has extremely high intelligence, and it's said to see every past, present, and future event. Yeah. yeah. That sounds There's right. There's alarming. Pokemon. There's Pokemon that are just, yeah, they're just like... Like this Pokemon created time and space. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and like, and like, like, I was not kidding when it's like, yeah, Wait this a is... Minute. This Pokemon created time and space. Like that's 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 Diamond and Pearl is like they are basically the gods. Amnesia machine for pigs just started making a lot more sense if there's Calyrexes running around in the UK for a Calyrex. I get it now. <laughs> oh no. You know, it's all coming together. Yeah. <laughs> it's all Calyrex yeah. all the way down. Yeah, that's that's what they were that was exactly what Pokemon was intending was like Okay, if anything, we're going to make uh, Amnesia Machine for Pigs make sense. There's like one there kind of plot hole in Machine for Pigs, and it's not even really a game that's about filling the plot hole. It's more about the philosophy and, and like the esoteric concerns about imperialism and capitalism. But hey, we, the Pokemon company, can kind of plug that one little gap. So <laughs> let's do it with this <laughs> DLC for Sword and Shield. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I I still think that Sword and Shield is a fun time, and uh, and I think and I think a lot of people are um, generally really positive about the Crown Tundra. Um, so if you if you have the game, I I would recommend giving it a shot. I think I think it's a lot of fun, and uh, I I've been enjoying my time with it. All right, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind playing it it, but I don't want to play all of Sword and Shield. So. Honestly, that, I mean, see, that's a, that's fair. I, I I don't blame you at all about that. Um, I just if, got if hope you're not pulled out in... for Pokemon Gun. <laughs> <laughs> someday, someday <laughs> it'll happen. We'll get a random the... Pokemon Direct, and they'll be like, "Here's like our brushing the teeth. Here's our sequel to the brushing teeth mini game or like phone game, and also Pokemon po Gun. Pokemon Gun, where you." It's the you're in america yeah well they already did that there's, one i know like the one in new york and that's just a trash know. pokemon there's, Trubbish, there's one yeah. there's one version on xbox and one version on xbox 360 hell yeah original xbox and xbox 360 yes pokemon gun and pokemon wet <laughs> oh <laughs> no and black what <laughs> xbox games i don't know yeah Oh yeah, because that's right. Because wet and black. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Black had red barrels. You blew them up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it also first game to have red barrels. It's true. It also had <laughs> yep. uh, every single bullet you could hear the casing after you fired it hit the ground. I, so thanks, I played, if there ever was a Pokemon gun, it was probably just the game black. I played a fair amount of black, and it it's was game. all right. It's fine. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If yeah, I, I'd like to go back and replay it sometime because I I, I liked that a lot. 
I don't. Uh, are we talking about the same right. thing? What, what have you been playing on? We're talking about a first person shooter <laughs> Me. called Black. Yeah, not Pokemon Black. Oh, Pokemon I thought you Black. said Pokemon Black. No. <laughs> We're talking about the Criterion game Black. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. No. I, Pokemon Black is like a real game, though. It is. Yes. So is Black. That's why I was confused at first, <laughs> is I didn't understand what Andre was referencing. I didn't I was either. Like, I was is like, a Pokemon Black. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, but Pokemon Black is a good game, so. Black was a game for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 2, and Xbox that had an Xbox version and a 360 version. Yep. Yeah. Same with Gun. Anyways. It's a good shooter if you're looking for a shooter to play at any point, everyone. I think it's backwards compatible on Xbox One. Anyway. So what, is, what have you been playing, Anyways. Andre? Me? This is yeah. out of order. Uh, yeah. I have been playing... Let's see. So last week, we'll continue from our discussion last week of Amnesia uh, Rebirth, sure. the newest from Frictional Games, the third game in the Amnesia series i guess um and i finished it that game it's got a lot of problems in that it's it feels like it came out 10 years ago like it just it very much feels like that first amnesia at least how i remember it there's probably pat could probably speak more to this since he's played amnesia dark descent more recently but just a lot of the puzzles the physics the way you're like in the world and your space and how you're interacting with things through the controls it's not great like uh, in very... original, original amnesia you would do stuff like click your mouse on a door and swing your mouse back to open it right? yep. like yep. that kind of stuff yep uh-huh yep and you're still doing that here oh. uh you're like you're doing cranks by doing your Cranking mouse it. in like a circle pattern like you're that's uh, yeah, that's yeah, so there's I crank it. Yep. Yeah, you know, and you're picking up <laughs> items and Circular like patterns. dragging them around the environment. Uh so that stuff d- didn't age well, I think. Um so that stuff is a little disappointing cuz you have to engage with a lot of that kind of bad feeling design. But the story is really good and the execution around it of the horror elements i think is maybe the best they've done out like at least on a first try because like soma they had people didn't really like the monster and the way it was in the world and so they're like okay you just will make it so the monster doesn't really matter and they took those lessons and they made them they applied them to rebirth where the monsters are there they're scary but ultimately like if you get caught it's not like a major issue you're not going to get sent back 20 minutes or something and lose a ton of progress so they're much better about just propelling you forward which is always i think the thing that kills a horror game is when you die and then suddenly you're like i have to replay the section now it's not really scary i know what to expect i'm just dealing with like the you know, no okay, kid, I have to be like extra careful and not get caught or whatever. And when you don't have to deal with that, it becomes like you can engage with it on like a, you can be scared and you go, okay, I'm not supposed to like do this. I want to try and the not are still die there, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. The monsters are still there. They're in your way. And like, I want to explore. I want to find like the notes and get all that information. And like, you could just run into kind of some rooms and just uh, minor mechanical spoilers. Like if you die, you just respawn basically not respawn, but you are placed back in the world in oh. like a, a near nearby oh, kind of like a birth as though you're back like a rebirth. No, no, <laughs> uh, no, but uh, yeah, you, you just, yeah, you you get it's, back in the area in a different like a different space, and it kind of clears the area so the enemies are gone. Yeah, mostly. yeah, it's almost like this again. These are we're still kind of in minor spoiler territory. It's really not that yeah. big of a deal. You actually find this out very early on, whether or not you kind of pick up on it. Um, but it's almost like a like a Prince of Persia Sands of Time rewind mechanic, mm-hmm. except you don't control the rewind. That's basically. Mm. It's not even necessarily a rewind. It no, could be you like forward. Yeah. Um, but it, but it, it, it kind of, 
that's sort of how they stylize it. Yeah. Um, and it's like yeah. a flight or f like a fight or flight thing where you're basically just like, I have to get out of here and going to like a, a nearby safe area. Oh, see, I actually read it differently. Maybe we should, well, we will. No, well, maybe I don't know how far you've gotten for, for a more spoilery thing. Um, so yeah, the, maybe that depends on how far you are in the game. Could be, uh, I don't know. Um, either way, I think that I, it's funny having, I think all of that like physics-y stuff is actually like, to me, that is what the game is. Like I that is what makes it, it an amnesia better. game. I think it's great. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, I think what makes it an amnesia game is they have amnesia. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but uh, but but I think I think the first game leans really hard. I replayed Dark Descent mm -hmm. and yeah. Machine for Pig. I for the first time played Machine for Pigs, um, which I haven't had time to actually write the article I want to write because we got a puppy. But uh, Machine for Pigs is fucking fantastic. I am really surprised that that game had such a poor reception when it came out. Or I'm not surprised, I guess, because of where the discourse was at the time. If you didn't play that game back then, because you were cons like you heard it wasn't good it's it's extremely good it's really really good it's like four four and a half hours long so it's easy to squeeze into an afternoon or an evening if you play a lot of games anyway really phenomenal game um the story is exceptional um anyway uh i think that rebirth at least so far as i have gotten which is i'm only about halfway a third to halfway through the game did you what was the last thing you did the thing we talked about last okay okay uh i think that the the physics stuff feels better in it than in previous mm -hmm. amnesia games and they don't ask you to do so so far as i've been through it mm -hmm. which even if they do this later on at this point i had already done two or three of these kinds of things mm -hmm. in dark descent like really kind of bad physics puzzles um mm -hmm. where you have to like I played with a guide because I didn't mm -hmm. want, I wanted yeah. to just get through it, which makes it a lot less scary, but also I just want to see the story and I didn't want to watch somebody else play it. So, um, and the puzzles in dark descent are not very good. They're like one room will have like three weights suspended from the ceiling. And you're supposed to realize that that means in the room across the hall, you have to hold the lever in place until each of the three weights in that room mirrors the other side of the room, which is like, <laughs> not very intuitive and no. there's nothing to indicate that that's how it works there's no lore or narrative justification mm -hmm. for why you're doing it it's just like i don't know this is how you fix the elevator and it's like yeah what <laughs> um and so far in rebirth i haven't seen anything like that um the, there's the ways... nothing there's nothing that bad um and there's like i think one of the big of issues in dark yeah. descent also like a lot of times they'll put a monster in an area where in like dark descent they'll kind of in yeah. an area where you're trying to find stuff or yes. puzzle solve they'll put a monster where they don't really do that in rebirth so uh you're able to kind of differentiate these things and there's like a little bit of like, oh, I'm not safe anymore, but they they give you space to like think about what you're doing. And it's not like the the puzzles aren't super physics-y, so you don't have to worry about that at least. Yeah. I the, and that that I like about Rebirth a lot. And like in some ways, I like the way that um I won't spoil any specific puzzles, but there's a puzzle about like, I don't know, an hour and a half in that is very much physics-y but not in the sense that dark descent is where it's like i'm gonna pull these levers and move these things it's more like mm -hmm. wait how does physics work oh right this is how i need to do this um and it feels pretty satisfying uh i'll mm -hmm. message you andre the thing that yeah. i'm talking about but i think it's been pretty great so far and the thing that um minor narrative spoilers for anyone who is really invested in the amnesia story and doesn't hasn't played yet um i think this is fine if you're planning to play the game and maybe might make you more mm -hmm. interested there is a thing that this game does with the concept of um it's very much still inspired by a sort of lovecraftian cosmic horror and the thing that it does that is so impressive to me with where i'm at thus far is the way that it characterizes the things that exist and the world that exists, worlds that exist on the other side of, you know, the portal or whatever, 
where in Lovecraft stories, one of their great faults, because in a lot of cases, the big bad evils are, are facsimiles for um, like cultures and ethnicities that Lovecraft was afraid of, uh, is that they don't, when there's a horrifying, when elder things are coming, going to come to earth and kill everyone. Yes. They have like a society on their side of the portal, but they don't, you don't ever learn anything about it other than like, it's horrible. It's a nightmare. And rebirth is more interested in saying, wait, what are these, what are these beings like think like and talk like and act like, and you're like actually getting some insight into their culture, which I think is yeah. really cool. Um, and really, really well done. Um, and so that's that's a that's that's a huge plus in the game's favor. So I'm very excited to finish it uh, and it, play through the rest of it. It has some very ambitious narrative moments. Yeah, uh, I I look forward to seeing how you uh, like end the game. Like what kind of path you take uh, when you get yeah. there. Yeah, because these game I don't know about uh, Machine for Pigs, but like no their other games have had uh, like multiple endings not like you know these elaborate branching paths just like kind of not necessarily binary but you've got like okay pick three uh, your mass effect three ending if you will um so it's yeah i i felt pretty good about the way things went down but yeah i i it'll be uh interesting to hear your thoughts on it because yeah there are some very ambitious moments that I think they they land and they execute well. Um, and part of that is there aren't really many games, uh, yeah. at least like big games that deal with motherhood um, in the game space. Uh, we've gotten so, you know, the dad game has become so ubiquitous at this point. It's like Sony's entire brand at this point almost but uh now we've got the mom game uh in amnesia rebirth and it's it's interesting and definitely one worth checking up even if you feel like oh horror games are too scary for me or you know i had trouble with amnesia because of the way they have uh dealt with or the way they have implemented the scary bits and the creatures it's a lot easier to just push past that stuff like there were so many sections that I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to run through here because uh, it's kind of meant for that. Or like, I don't think I'm going to miss out on anything. Uh, and they tie it back to, uh, they actually do tie it back just a little bit to the first Amnesia game. Yep. Just a little bit. I think um, you don't need to replay that game if you no. if you played it back then. You, but you if don't. you, like me, had not played it, I think it's worth seeing it because it was kind of a, important game and i having played it i'm glad that i played it mm -hmm. i'm glad i took the time to spend a few hours going through it with a guide and um because so much of amnesia dark descent is padded mm -hmm. on those sequences where oh yeah you're in the dark kind of scraping around while a monster chases you so if you have a guide mm -hmm. you can cut that game's length in half it uh, yeah uh, rebirth feels a lot more deliberate yes um i uh, there are certain there are certain moments in that game that I, I, cards on the table i mean if the game continues to strike me in the way that it has thus far i, I anticipate having it in a pretty high spot on my own lists um i think that's very it's because it's pushing my specific buttons so much uh, i don't necessarily mean to say that i think like must play for everyone um so i'm not necessarily saying i would argue for it super high on like a group list but mm -hmm. i know personally i'm really 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 enjoying it and there's been several almost every moment that involves an enemy but several moments where m malevolent forces have appeared and i have just been like holy shit that was cool <laughs> that was so well done the way that that was that was that was that happened um and the enemies themselves are not particularly scary when you're like face to face in my opinion but mm -hmm. the way that they deploy them is really really cool uh and smart so far yeah. anyway yeah uh, yeah they they do some ambitious moments they land them i think and yeah i, I look forward to talking to you more about it once you finish yeah. it uh the other thing i've been playing that pat has also put a little time into is ghost runner which I talked about months ago with like, I don't even know this, 
one of the Steam Game Fest things. Uh, they had a demo for this. This is the first person par not, not parkour like free running mirrors edge type game with where you have a katana and it's very good cyberpunk dystopia you're like a, a robot ninja with some oh, like, like Raiden. A, kind of kind of yeah yeah basically yeah you've got high heels and uh, white blood you're not as cool as Raiden. Is Raiden cool? Yes. Hell yeah. He's, he's like anime cool. I don't know yes. if he's like cool, yes. Yes. cool. Raiden is cool. We're not we're not okay. we're not we're not litigating that here. <laughs> but yeah, if I remember you don't you agree, talk... you're wrong. Raiden's remember, cool. Wasn't the demo like five minutes or something, Andre? Like it was really short. I, it was, it's like the first two levels. Um and I it could be really short if you're like this is a game that is like it's timed. You're meant to do things really quick, like a Mirror's Edge, where you're running through these levels. And theoretically, I think they want you to play it multiple times and oh, yeah. you know get your runs down. And because uh, this is like a one hit, one kill game, you kill everyone in one hit, and you get killed in one hit. Like super hot. Yes. It, yep. Yeah. It's like super hot meets Mirror's Edge meets like My... Katana Zero or like uh, what's that ninja game? Uh, Mark, of the, Mark of the Ninja. What's that ninja game? <laughs> it's Pikachu. It's Metal Gear. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, my partner was. God damn it. <laughs> My partner was watching me play uh, um, Ghost Runner and she was like, uh, oh, is this like super hot? And I was like, uh, kind of. Uh, kind of? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's got that, like, you can slow time down. You've got, like, you're not, like, throwing so much stuff, but, like, the time stuff and the one-hit kills really bring it to uh, super hot-esque levels uh, where it also ties into, like, Katana Zero or Mark of the Ninja. And then, yeah, so it's it's a cool game for like checking out a uh, cyberpunk city and doing sick wall runs and shit and like super cool ninja stuff. I think they should, if you get this game and start playing it and get frustrated with the way the enemies are mm. work early, um, you get the, uh, you get an ability that lets you deflect their bullets fairly yeah. early i think that should have been something they give you i think by it default. was in the demo yeah i mean uh, i think so it, it should, makes the game just have that but yeah. infinitely more playable because i was very frustrated early on not even because i thought it was particularly hard it just felt very like unfair kind of mm -hmm. where it's yeah. like the way the enemies choose to shoot at you is like sometimes they have a predictable mm -hmm. like pattern and then sometimes they just like aimbot you and yeah. <laughs> they like lead you and then you get hit by them mm -hmm. even if you're trying to dodge it's just yeah it, it can be frustrating but the deflect that deflect ability gives you the chance to like send their bullet back at them or at least deflect it away and it makes yeah. it a lot more like oh i have an active defense measure other than just dodging um mm -hmm. and, and you start to unlock fun. other abilities like yeah. i i'm I think I just got a second ability. Uh, the first one you get is like a blink where you yeah. kind of slow things down and then you can line up like a couple people and then you can slice through them uh, just instantly or you can slice through bullets even uh, or like laser blasts, I guess is what they are because it's the future cyberpunk. Ooh. Um, is that like a horse And sound? you've got, yeah, it's a cyberpunk Ooh. horse. They should have. They should have started the game with the clip. They should have gotten. Like fuck it. They should have stole it from CD Projekt because they deserve it. Uh, the clip of Keanu Reeves saying "Wake the fuck up, Samurai. We've got a city to burn," mm -hmm. and that should have just been the intro to Ghost Runner, and then no more narration through I, the rest. I mean, of the that's game. that's basically what it is. It's basically the plot of Ghost Runner. So <laughs> to wake up is why don't you put is, on a little makeup? Like it is actually very <laughs> yes uh but the crocodile chop um <laughs> it is very similar to like that kind of idea of you've got this ai in your head and it's got a vendetta and so you're there to um kind of do what it says you've got amnesia tie into that hey uh hey. yeah 
Are you descending? Hey. Dark you're no, you're ascending. ascending. Oh, fuck. Oh. The opposite. <laughs> the, 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 light, the light, the light, the light ascent. Got it. I think it's, yeah. uh, I think it's the a really bright, cool game. Bright. Yeah. I think uh, the bright the, ascent. <laughs> I think some of the, uh, the, the, I, it's some of the checkpointing sucks. Um, and some of it is perfect. That's the thing is it's like, sometimes you get the, yeah. just the perfect checkpoint to try a room over and over. And it's very satisfying. Sometimes it's like, I have to jump over this thing every time. Why didn't you just mm -hmm. put me on the other side of the thing? Yeah, yeah. There's no skill involved in vaulting over it. And instead, mm -hmm. all it does is every 10th time I try it, I fuck up the timing on the vault mm -hmm. and then I fall yeah. and I have to wait another 10 seconds. Not really, because you don't have to it, wait. To it, it is very snappy. Like you just hit R yeah. and then you're like respawn. But you do have spot, to wait to die. But... <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if, which fall, is if the issue is you fall annoying. down something, you have to fall for yeah. a while before you finally die. Um, yeah. So there's some frustrations like that. I'm a little hesitant to say. I've seen some people saying it's like, "Holy shit, this is the, one of the best games of the year." I have not yet hit that moment where I'm like, mm -hmm. "Oh my god, this is amazing!" But it's really fun. It's cool. I recommend it's it like, if you're into if, doing yeah. cool cyberpunk ninja if you can, stuff. If you can put in the time, or if you're the type of person who likes to put in the time into something like a Mirror's Edge, totally. or like yeah. those kinds of like high precision platformer type yeah. games, 3D platformers, then it, I think you'll find a lot to like here. Yeah. This, this is going to sound like a really weird comparison, and sorry, sorry for that. But to me, like I really like Trials, mm -hmm. like. Uh, and this sounds like it kind of has a similar vibe to trials in that like you're trying stuff you're getting into the mechanics you're maybe doing yep. a run over a couple of times to really get it so like i mean like it's uh, they're continuous levels like the levels are mm -hmm. long but they've got like discrete encounters like so maybe yeah. you'll have like yeah. five like combat encounters over the course of one level mm -hmm. and then like solving some puzzles but i wouldn't say it's very like trials like because no, there's no. basically one path through everything and it's not right. super difficult but yeah that, that's why i'm like saying it's not a perfect comparison but like it sounds like it could hit those same kind of like i think it, i think if you like trials and also think mirror's edge is cool mm -hmm. in theory then totally um it's mirror's edge sure. if mirror's edge had like done combat in a smart way <laughs> yeah it didn't just yeah. give you a crappy gun yeah yeah. I and do you've wish got, that like, you had grappling like a, hooks and yeah. like air dashes and stuff. So I do yeah. wish that you had a, a gun. I'm mean, maybe you get one eventually. I'm sure that might be an ability, but maybe get like some like shuriken or something. I don't yeah. Know. Um, what I'm really hopeful for with Ghost Runner, first of all, it's kind of a long, like, kind of long for what it is, in that it's like 12 levels or something, and each one could take you anywhere from like like 10 minutes on the first try to like half an hour. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say. I. I hard to say how long it is but I, I i was surprised after playing for like an hour i was like three levels in uh mm -hmm. and there were a lot i left. i Oops. saw so it will show you your uh like steam friends times uh and so i saw like after the second level it's like here's what pat did and i was like oh i'm like five minutes ahead of pat i'm good <laughs> yeah i don't know it's, does, maybe i just suck at it it's possible maybe it's, it's does, possible does, does, does it does it you said it on me yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so okay. you've got the ai in your head uh who is basically he's like you are my bodyguard uh but i'm dead now uh but this is like uh, there's a lot of time has passed and basically wants revenge on someone. I'm not on sure Dr. right Octopus. now. I'm, does does he yeah, also Dr. want Octopus, right? Does he also want vengeance? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, he wants so vengeance some... on Doc Ock. Okay. And when I say that, it's because literally Doctor Octopus from Into the Spider Verse is at the start of the the game in a cutscene. It's just uh, yep. Yeah, it's it's just her. Whole, yeah. She got a haircut, but it's just her. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was like, so, this is, this is almost, almost something they should worry about for copyright purposes. Cause <laughs> that is, that is a Dr. Octopus if I've ever seen her. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, it, it's borrowing from a lot, but it's got its own thing going yeah, enough it, that it's, you know, it's very cool. fun. But I really hope that you can go back through the game with all the upgrades unlocked, because mm -hmm. I think that the upgrade system and the way it's basically like you play Tetris on a board with different yeah. pieces to, to to put upgrades in 
It's um, like Tetris P- Tetraminos in like a Resident Evil Four style attaché case to oh, like yeah. do your. Huh. Uh, it reminds me do of your um, power ups. It reminds me a little bit of Near Automata, how the cell, how the, how like putting the chips in worked, except sure. it's more, mm-hmm. except you're dealing with Tetraminos instead of like slots. Just like yeah. Um, so it, it's it's cool. That stuff is neat. Yeah, you got like, oh, I can't put anything in this square, so I've got to like put stuff around the square, and you're yeah. unlocking stuff over. And the it course convinces of it. you to try things that you wouldn't have tried because you're like, well, I really want to use this ability, but the only thing that fits with it is this other one that I think is garbage. But I guess I'll plug it in because why not? And then you go, oh, that's useful. It's more useful than I thought it would be. So yeah, uh, yeah, and that's what I've been playing. I've also picked up app, uh, what Art of Rally, uh, but I don't really have much to say about that. I played like one race in that. It's, it's like a neat little pastel uh isometric uh, rally game uh, from the creator of Absolute Drift, if you ever played that. Uh, but I'll probably talk about that next week after I've put some more time in. Oh, and uh, also Dark Pictures, the new uh, game, which I want to talk about, but I haven't played enough of it yet. So next week. Cool. In the meantime, it's going to be November next week. You can't talk about scary games anymore. Oh, the window uh, is closing today. Uh, today. Okay. Well, okay. So uh, no, I'm just kidding. What is, you what, can talk what, about next week. What's, what's it called? What's it called? I can't even remember what it's called. Little hope. Yes. Unreadable. <laughs> um, no. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, next on our list, who we're going to go to, uh, let's go, Pat, I want to know about your secret surprise. Okay, we could talk, I'll talk about this stuff very briefly. Um, the <laughs> This is stupid. I only just said a secret surprise because if I had put it down, people have been like, what the fuck is this? You Friend know, mine... it, you, you say that, but when I saw that in our notes, uh, when I got up this morning, I was like, oh. It's to make everyone far more excited than they'll be once I share surprise. what it is. How does everyone feel about uh, a, a fellow... Farm simulator. My friend and yours, Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> you playing Psychonauts um, again? No. Like the, the historical figure? The historical figure, yeah. How do you feel about Napoleon? Uh, Ten words or less. Like feelings about him. That's I read that <laughs> very good. I read that Reddit relationships post about the guy who got obsessed with Napoleon. Oh my god, that was so good. And he well, was just, like buying Napoleon books thing. and buying like scrolls of Napoleon. Perhaps you could have sex his, with Napoleon in wall. Hold Fast: Nations at War, a game that I spent a few hours digging into last night. That uh, is hilarious and very fun to play with. Did you some have good sex friends. with Napoleon? No, but maybe that's in there. I don't know. I didn't get that deep into it. You could say that about uh, any game. Yeah, but <laughs> but but this game's actually about Napoleon. <laughs> Allison, I mean, can you not have sex with Napoleon and Pokemon Crown Tundra? Uh, I not that I'm aware of, but again, I haven't finished Look, it. So you can't even have sex with Napoleon in Assassin's Creed Unity, which is a game that is explicitly about like france and during the french revolution yeah. <laughs> uh no hold fast news is a war i just want to touch on briefly because it's fucking hilarious and if you're i don't think anyone on this podcast should play it and most people listening probably <laughs> shouldn't play it not because it isn't good it's very good at the thing it sets out to do but it's basically like battlefield except <laughs> like napoleonic warfare <laughs> in the 18th century <laughs> and you can play as prussia or france or britain or russia uh and uh it's really funny because it's like you're playing battlefield but you have muskets <laughs> so you get to shoot one time and then you press r to reload and then there's like a timer on screen and your character goes through all of the animations of like tearing of like putting the cartridge in and tamping down the powder and the, the oh it's funny it's 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 very good and okay. there's a button that you can press you press the b key by default and it's i forget what they call it but it's basically the like yell button where your character oh. will yell something in their native like, language like in chivalry like, like, yes just oh. like in chivalry <laughs> just like in chivalry okay and uh you got cannons you got artillery where you can where you're like trying to aim the artillery there's different classes if you're an, a line infantry you simply cannot operate a cannon that is just not that is that is just not done um and there's interesting mechanics like the battlefields are huge as you would expect and mostly empty <laughs> because that's how Napoleonic warfare worked. <laughs> they just fought in big, huge fields. So 
you spawn all the way back at your camp and it sucks to run all the way. But if someone spawns as a flag bearer, you can spawn on them and then get back into the fight faster. Uh, you can be a musician. You can play a fife. I played a fife for a while last night. Can you put in play a fife tracks? Huh? Can you put in MIDI tracks for your fife? No, uh, I don't know. You can't. Very you, when you hit, you click the button to start playing, and then a little menu pops up, and you click on what song you want to play. So it's possible okay. that you could load in your own songs. I don't know. Probably. Um, I'll tell you most of the time, the music that you're listening to is actually whatever the people near you are blasting through on their voice chat. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, so I heard some sea shanties cause there are also naval encounters where you're on ships, <laughs> uh, which are very fun because you're like trying to shoot, physically shoot the cannons at people. Cause it's like one person's the captain and they try, they, they helm the, the ship, but then all the other sailors have to actually fire the cannons manually. Um, it's pretty fun. It, it's, 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 it's stupid in some ways, but you, it has interesting ideas. Like obviously muskets are wildly inaccurate. So you'll aim and fire at someone. And even if they're standing about 50 feet away and you aimed right at them, your musket ball may like go super wide. So they give you benefits to your, I think bonuses, your accuracy. I could be wrong, but if you got a drummer and a fife player right there, you're standing by a standard bearer who's helping people spawn, and you got an officer that sets up a firing line, which actually shows you in the environment where you need to stand to shoot, and then everybody shoots at the same time, you get a massive bonus to your accuracy. So it's like people who actually organize and say like, and do all that stuff will definitely win the game, <laughs> which is very interesting. And it like incentivizes you to role play as the kind of the characters that you're playing. And it kind of fits in like what I was saying about phasmophobia last week to that role play area where this is not a game like battlefield or call of duty, which are games that I like um, where you're like trying to have high skill. It's more about, I am a line infantry. I need to walk with other line infantry and there's like artillery going over your head and people screaming stuff in voice chat. So far, I didn't actually hear anything like vile in voice chat, particularly there's one captain who was hurling some insults at another vessel that I found a little bit ribald uh, and not, uh, not, not quite to my taste, but nothing like slurs or anything deeply offensive. That's surprising Uh, for the internet. Yeah, which is part of the other reason I bring it up because it is a it is a game that has like a pretty solid community from what I've heard, and uh, you can like, and you kind of need to communicate to perform well. The nice thing though is it's the 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 nougaty core of this, and then we can move on. Is it has a feature that every single multiplayer game should adopt until the end of time, which is at all times on screen, it has a it shows you a button prompt for just turning off voice chat. So if you ever need to like completely bail out of voice chat, you just push this button and it shuts off all incoming and outgoing voice chat. Instead of going to having to go into a menu and turn it off, you just press the button and then you can press it again to turn it back on. So if you're standing by someone and they're saying a bunch of hateful garbage, you can turn it off altogether. And then the next time when they're like not near you, you can turn it back on because it's all proximity based. Um, So that part's kind of nice. Yeah, Dota Dota did something similar to that where you would open up the scoreboard and they would just have like a little mute. Or they do that icon. there's like scoreboard mute stuff in a lot of uh shooters too but this is such a faster you don't even have to know who it is that's saying the junk around you you just oh it's just a global kind it's of just setting. a global shut off oh, it's like a cool. global like i don't want to talk to people anymore which is really i mean it has push to talk too so it's not like mm. it's open mic otherwise there's a mute button to mute yourself there's push to talk you can turn on and then also it has this global mute that you can just turn off all voice chat which i that's think is a really cool feature for I saw that and was like, I would engage with a lot more team-based games if there was an option to do that. Because if I could just have like a safety switch, that's like, nope, I don't want to hear this anymore. Because that's the reason that I totally bailed off of Valorant is because I had two or three games in a row with a pub with one pub player. The rest of us, were, the rest of the people were people I knew, and they called me really awful, like terrible bullshit. And I was like, you know what? I spent basically an hour of my night getting called slurs. I'm not going to play this game. Sometimes you're like, you know, I'm going to treat myself and not 
not yeah, and I'm be called gonna, slurs. I mean, I will go play, obviously, Modern Warfare, as a, I always like to preface, has a billion political problems uh, and is is not, you know, it sucks in a lot of ways. But uh, one of the ways it doesn't suck is that you can play that game and never talk to another person. So I just was like, nope, I'm just going to play that game with my friends <laughs> and not get called horrible shit. Um, and so right. I think it's cool that Holdfast has a good way to just cut off voice communication because right. it's also so, i didn't use it because anyone was rude or mean but someone was blasting edm <laughs> on we were playing on a european server yeah and at first it was funny and then like after two minutes of hearing the like blown out edm coming from this person riding their horse around back and forth i was like okay i'm done with this and was, shut off the <laughs> was, this, chat. was this from the russian faction <laughs> Uh, in fact, it was. We that were, that makes fact, total sense. We were on a European server because there's actually almost always at least two or three full servers. It has, mm. which is only like, it's 150 players per game. So it's only like, it's under a thousand people playing usually, but uh, Big servers. you can find a game and uh, it has a server browser instead of matchmaking. So uh, it works. But the only server that was open uh, was the European server. <laughs> so we were playing on that and... Um, yeah, we were Russia, and there was a lot of EDM blasting happening. That, that checks out for Russia. Okay, I have I have one question. Um, one of my favorite parts of chivalry is going into a server with low grav, because as soon as low gravity is on, the game doesn't under like the game wasn't programmed with it in mind. So anytime you like jump really high and then start falling, your guy or whatever just starts going, ah, like screaming as though they're falling. And just everyone on the server is screaming because they all think they're falling. Does this game have that? Uh, no, not specific. Oh. Very specific. I'll say, Damn I it. mean, like when you, we, we sieged a fort at one point, this game, I mean, you have 75 people per team. It is a cacophony of people just slamming the B key <laughs> so that their characters yeah, are just like that's pretty good too. Yeah. They're just, just screaming. screaming in whatever Which, language the faction is also a good part of, uh, and there's like four or five, there's like four or five different things they can say. So it's just like, <laughs> It's not the same thing over and over. It's just like people screaming. And then if you play on the European server, which you should, even though the pings are bad, <laughs> because you also get people role-playing in voice chat and screaming things in their native language. And so it's like, <laughs> is it the game or is it someone in voice chat? It's a cultural experience <laughs> is what you're Who's saying. Say? <laughs> it's it's It was a lot of fun. We had fun. We played for like an hour and a half or so and and enjoyed it so, a lot and sounds uh, it's very on, dumb yeah it is it's on sale <laughs> right now for like 10 bucks so if if you find yourself looking for a battlefield-esque experience it's well made too like it does all the things it's trying to do pretty well so it's not particularly janky or anything and Andre. oh never mind now oh, here yeah. you know all right can you hear me now yeah good mm -hmm. uh and uh speaking of cyberpunk because that that would have been a much better segue. Uh, so we'll just we'll go back. We're gonna delete all of what you just said. <laughs> we're gonna do this next segment. Then we'll redo the last one, and you can tell us all about Watchdogs Legion. It's okay. Everything. Tell us one hundred percent about this game. Everything you know. I mean, first of all, it's totally cool if you look at Watchdogs Legion or any of Ubisoft's upcoming releases and say. I don't want to give Ubisoft any of my money. They're shitty because they are uh, That's true. <laughs> for a variety of re reasons. So I definitely want to preface it with that. I was interested in playing Watch Dogs because some of the discourse around it was um, I'm always interested in playing games that are like meh for some reason. <laughs> I, I'm much more interested <laughs> to see how people arrive at the opinion that a game is like just okay than either really bad or really great um i don't know why that is it's like uh, that's like when we had monty on however many months ago and yes. she asked can what is the most average anime you can think it, of it, it totally yeah. yeah yeah it's it's very Cowboy much that Bebop. and uh and so i i grabbed a bunch of a bunch a <laughs> i see of, that face jeff <laughs> I, I grabbed a month of uh of UB, ubisoft connect plus or whatever the fuck it's called now connect um 
uh, which was, I won't get into it, a terrible okay. process of trying to actually get a month of that. Um, but anyway, uh, and um, and so I installed Watch Dogs Legion. I will say one nice thing about Ubisoft Uplay Plus, whatever the fuck it is, you get the ultimate versions and the season passes of the games that, That's uh, good. which is yeah. which is how all of those services should work. It's bullshit it's to right. like yeah. have to buy a season pass for something that you're getting through a subscription. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's nice. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's like the game starts and I mean, spoilers for the opening mission of of Watch Dogs. I, I you shouldn't care about this. Um, <laughs> like the spoilers, you shouldn't care about the spoilers. The opening mission you're playing is like a MI5 agent infiltrating Parliament with like dead sec people. Dead sec being the the good guy hackers from Watch Dogs, kind of guiding you along, and you find out that like there's these bombs all over parliament um and you have to disable them to save everyone's lives that are in parliament at the middle of the night uh and it is like i was it's as someone who's played most of ubisoft's open world games for at least a little bit each this one is like it plays like the division which kind of played like Watch Dogs 2 which kind of plays like uh, Assassin's Creed if you use a mouse and keyboard, sort of. Like, it's weird how this game just doesn't feel like it has any identity whatsoever when it comes to controlling it, because it is just, it's fine, but it's like, I mean, it's very much like playing The Division 2, which is a game I do not like. Uh, and, um, mm -hmm you kind of start off by like choking these people out and for context Watch Dogs 2 is a game where you can play the whole game without killing a single person and i didn't particularly like the world in Watch Dogs 2 but the characters are fantastic and the story is like goofy at times and like pretty well thought out tonally <laughs> Watch Dogs Legion is like i went into the room and they were like, oh, you have to move quietly. Take out the guards from behind. And I walked up, and then he just fucking snaps the guy's neck. I was like, okay. <laughs> we got some some different stakes here, I guess. And so I snapped several people's necks. And then you find out that you have to disable these bombs. There's like this AI voice called Bagley that's talking to you and is very much like a Jarvis. Sounds almost identical to Jarvis. Um, but not as good because Jarvis is portrayed by like a good actor <laughs> versus Bagley being like a fairly stock standard. No offense to Bagley's voice actor. I'm sure it's partly the script, but anyway, then the game's like, Oh fuck waves of enemies are coming in. You got to shoot these guys. And then they had, you just handed a nine millimeter and you have to just kill waves of very stupid enemies that run into the room three at a time and stand there and shoot at you. And the shooting is fucking terrible. It's like you're shooting a Nerf gun. Like that's what the, 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 you can see the bullet slowly leave the, the, the gun and then slowly travel to the enemy. And it looks like a Nerf dart. I was like, Weird. and I thought so much so that I was like, am I using some kind of tranquilizer gun? But it's not, it's a, it's a gun. And then you get an MP5 and you shoot a lot more people with an MP5. And then you find out that, it was all for naught because there were bombs all over the city and they all blow up instead. And the bad guy hacker is like, ha ha ha, I got you. And then he kills the MI five agent. So okay. it's like, it's a much darker intro than Watch Dogs two, which was like teen hacker who is rad sneaking into a facility and specifically not killing anyone. Um, but um, after that, you're, you're presented with a character select screen where you kind of pick your your first and there's narrative stuff between all this but it's whatever uh it's extremely predictable stuff that you would expect um and you pick a character and that's kind of the interesting part of this game is the procedural character generation that it does where you have um anyone can be a player character in the game i think it's important to note that like their marketing campaign of like play as anyone is kind of bullshit i don't know that there are i mean the uh, they're they're not representing everyone in this game there are like disabilities that are not represented in this game specifically there are um i'm i would i am sure that there are uh like genders and sexualities not represented in this game i'll say 
they don't specifically it's not like everyone is is cis and straight i believe that there are trans characters and there's there's people that are have varying sexualities but still i think they need to do better if they're going to say play as anyone because right. that like, language sounds inclusive in a way that it is not um so sorry Alex. right that's like a, that's like a tall order and totally. when you have the resources of ubisoft like you don't no, really don't have... you know it's hard to animate women <laughs> and thankfully that's not on display oh, here but i mean i think and maybe i haven't played it very much maybe there are people who use wheelchairs in the game i don't know um i don't believe they've shown any of that in their marketing which is something that i would have done if i were to use a slogan like play as anyone i mean play as anyone uh, is like not to take away from what you're saying because what you're saying is absolutely true but it's so easy to go you can play as any of the characters we've made here I mean. that exist in these open yeah. world games. Right. So. I agree. But I mean, I mean, I but just, I mean, like also the marketing was very much like you can play as a grandma, you know, like yeah. that's what I'm it getting was at. Like, yeah. So anyway, yeah. that caveat aside, I, I just I felt I feel it's important to point that out because it, it's something that's irked me about their marketing the whole time. But that caveat aside, it is interesting to see the way that they um, kind of sp spread these characters out. And um, they have bios that don't really inform their gameplay, but are also, it might be like, oh, this person's a rich stockbroker. And so they have like a discount card at a clothing store or something. Um, like they have a platinum card for this, for clothes, which, and then it goes all the way from like that to like, oh, this person has a gun. <laughs> That's their special thing. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> like they come with a firearm. <laughs> Uh, I saw one and it was someone's like the the person was a musician, their trait was like trumpeter, and their most recent like internet search was when do you empty the spit valve on a trumpet? <laughs> Some of that stuff is pretty clever. Okay. It's like but it's uh, like you're you're in your fifties. Yeah, true. And you should know that you already. Know, you you should know that. Yes, yeah, that's very true. Oh, correct. I the character I ended up choosing was a character named uh, Tanaka, who is a professional, uh, is Japanese and is a professional uh, MMO player. Um, and uh, I picked him because he because he seemed cool and he had a, has a recon drone for his like special thing. You can just call. The problem is that as soon as I started playing as him, I really wish they let you preview their voice because as soon as I started playing as him, he was like. We got this fam you hard and i was like no i don't want this i made a poor decision i don't want to play as this character but there's nothing i can do there's no way for me to get a do-over uh you can recruit more obviously so i don't have to play as him forever but he was and and he was like this is fucking mental and stuff like very like playing up the like things shit is wild right now and it's like yeah man you decided to join a hacker collective. You were you were like walking down the street and then decided to join a hacker collective and then just ran to a building and now you're a hacker. It is pretty mental. You're right. So I don't know. The characters, is there enough depth to any of them to where you would want to find their entire story? Like they don't have stories. Okay. That's great. the thing. Wonderful. That, that I mean, they have their background that you read in their bio, but they don't have stories. The That's story like the, the, the extent to it is that like you reading that like little blip yeah. that like yeah you don't when to open the spit valve the comparison like, that the real comparison is is xcom here that's that's what you're doing i mean you're not you're you're in the sense that you can totally like role play these characters and kind of map your own lore to them which is interesting and if you like doing that i think that there might be some fun to be had with it um but there's no they have no depth. The characters have no depth whatsoever. You know what? Which is this... like the problem with the whole thing. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is this sounds just like the Caligula, Caligula effect. Um, I, yeah. We talked about that last year or something. And it's like basically a persona kind of game where there's like hundreds of characters and you can kind of get to be friends with yes. any of them. But their their stories are just generic. Like it's yes. like there's a few that have interesting stories, but like it's just so the generic. And it's like it's it's just a mile wide and an inch deep, right? Like the characters in Genshin Impact have like a billion times more story than the characters in Watch Dogs Legion. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the point, the thing is that's frustrating about this approach, and I knew this was going to happen. I don't know why they, like, this is a narrative problem that that I don't trust them to solve if their big gun that they're bringing in is Chris Avalone. Like, 
who is the guy that they was supposed to like solve this problem. Yeah. Um, but uh, is the story of the game. There are characters, there are main characters in the game. You just don't play as them. The main characters are the talking heads on your radio. There's Sabine and who's a, who's the woman who kind of runs dead sec and Bagley. And I guess there's other characters too. And they talk, they do tons of talking. They're always constantly talking in your ear about the story. And they're always constantly talking to other characters. And you're just kind of a, I mean, your characters you're talk, cipher. but you're just sort of a cipher that runs around and they're like, now you got to go here and do this. Now you got to go here and do this. And it's disappointing because I think there's actually an interesting game in there. If they had said, okay, here's two hours of setup narratively. Now what you're playing is more of a procedural open world game where like an XCOM, you have an end goal in mind and you're probably going to play it over and over and over again, trying to achieve that. Mm. That could have been really interesting, I think, because there's mechanical stuff here that's cool. Like some of the ways that the hacking and the drones and stuff works is really neat. And the decision to like, well, maybe I'm going to just shoot in this one. Maybe I'm going to sneak around and take people out. Maybe I'm going to fly a drone in. The the options there stab at sort of an immersive simmy kind of thing. But the problem is that it's wrapped up in like story missions that you're not going to want to play more than once. And so yeah. I think like the game has a permadeath and Iron Man mode. The Iron Man mode just means you can't turn permadeath off once you start. The permadeath mode, you can turn it off, but then you can't turn it back on again. Those right. seem very interesting to me. And I wish they had built a game that was more built around the idea of you have permadeath. So you're trying to like liberate these districts and it's going to take you 20 hours, but you could also lose all your shit and have to start over. And here's 10 different difficulties to try it on. That could have been really interesting. Instead, they built another. They, instead, they built another Ubisoft open world game with a shitty story. I feel it is so far anyway, um, and like you said, mile wide, inch deep. So I don't know. It's yeah, like the it sounds completely unappealing to me in that like any character you're playing, like you don't care about ultimately. Like you're, basically, you're, you're, your connection to that character you, is a couple lines of text. You will only care about them as much as you like make yourself care about them i mean you'll care about them as much as you care about your XCOM characters but XCOM's a better game so it's easier to care about those characters so yeah that's it i'll probably keep playing it some because i do want to see more of the story um because it's i'm interested to see the ways in which it tries to tackle this weird like anti-fascism but also we're a major video game corporation and we're really bad at understanding anti-fascism that they clearly have exhibited in every other game they have ever made yeah <laughs> right uh well so. one question i have about watchdogs legion um because what even put me on put it on my radar was that you know we had the co-optation of revolutionary imagery and coalitional um coalitional activities uh mm -hmm. and the and the fantasy here was that you would actually get or maybe some kind of simulation of friction. Like you actually do have to work to recruit people, not just, you know, do one fetch quest or three fetch quests or choose the right dialogue option. But like, it's, it's a, it's a little more crunchy than that. Um, and from what, from what I'm getting, that's not the case. So I, I'm curious as to know what the, what the recruitment process is, if any of that, if any of the hard work that goes into coalition building, and revolutionary politics and anti-fascist movements uh if any of that made it in or if it's just all uh red washing if you will <laughs> um so i haven't done a lot there are recruitment mechanics that i haven't encountered yet so i don't have a full picture of that largely the way that it is portrayed is in character's bio they have some line that's like the reason why maybe they might want to join dead sec it's like um their brother's in jail like that their brother was was arrested unjustly or um they they one time the police shot at them and when they didn't do anything wrong like 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 things like that that are sort of their like moment of like oh this is oppressive this is wrong i should fight against it and typically <laughs> hilariously your opening character they just like they're like here's some people that might want to join dead sec and then you just pick them from a menu and then you're warped into them and they're like, I want to join dead sec. And then 
they're and then then it's like you get a phone they get a phone call and then then they're like okay i'll go there it's bad but when it comes to recruiting other characters it is largely like it is a fetch quest but it is at least narratively couched in you doing something significant for them even though gameplay wise it's like go here sneak by some guards and get a macguffin it it's they they clearly have it's like they understand that coalition building and recruitment for in, in in activist movements is difficult, but they also don't understand how difficult or the mechanics of actually doing that <laughs> in real life. Uh, so I think it, it could be worse for sure, but it also could be a lot better. And that's true of so far, a lot of the narrative tropes that it leans on. I was extremely concerned at first when I heard that it potentially leans on the concept of like good protester versus bad protester. Um, in that you're this hacker group and the way they set it up is there's like zero day and they're the bad hackers that will do anything. And they're the ones who blew up a bunch of bombs around the city and blamed it on you. And now you're, you, you've been outlawed and no one believes you and stuff. It's pretty clear from early on that zero day is going to end up being like the head of the private security force that comes in to be the new police force. I, I, that seems very thinly veiled, Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's more interesting and complex than that. But that made that kind of dispelled those fears because it became clear that it's not going to be a good ver protester versus bad protester mm -hmm. thing. It's going to be a conspiracy theory narrative, which is is fine. I mean, it's and not necessarily conspiracy theory in the harmful way, but just in the like X Files way. And you know, they do. They are at least willing to say like the police are bad. <laughs> That's more courage oh, than I've seen from most triple a video novels. games yeah. but I mean, honestly at least it wouldn't expect most triple a studios to be you know that upfront about it but yeah i mean it's and i should i should i should walk that back a little bit they're not saying right they're not saying bad, it explicitly which is but... what i would say they're saying that police in this context are bad and doing bad things which is and it's a little more explicitly police a police force than you get in something like i don't know uh I was going to say Half-Life, except Half-Life does better than Watch Dogs Legion. So uh, <laughs> Half-Life is another oh, example of sure. a very good uh, of, of anti-fascism done fairly well. I was thinking um, of Half-Life 1, and I'm like, wait, where? But no, you're talking I mean, about <laughs> Half-Life 2. Yeah, yeah Combat. Half-Life 2, for sure. Watch Dogs is not as yeah. good as Half-Life 2. Well, wow, a, okay. that's a pretty okay. bold Whoa. statement. <laughs> Whoa. Hold on, you know. <laughs> I thought, oh, geez. I thought that's what we were getting set up for, that it was better. Watch Dogs isn't as good as one of the greatest games of all time. Oh, no. It sounds okay. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I think... sounds... I, I'm vaguely interested in checking it out, but I don't know if I'm necessarily, like, full price checking it out. I, I, no, I've got I would a... not pay full price for this game. I would... I would. I mean, I don't like to veer into purchase advice because that's just not my goal as a critic, really. Um, however, I would say this is not a six. You should not spend sixty dollars on this video game. Yeah, uh, um, I have a free copy of this game, but I still don't. Of. I still don't want to play I, it. <laughs> I should have been given a this copy is... of this game, but do you want I my code? You're a coward. You should try Alex. I don't know. If yeah. I, I don't know if I could. Uh, I can try it. I'll send you. you my, I'll send. I'll send you my code. This is fucking wild. So we were talking about it, and <laughs> in our chat, and Alex is like, "I have a free code that I got with my video card," and I was like. Well, I'm going to check it out, but I don't want to feel basically I didn't want to feel like I had to play through the whole thing. So I was very <laughs> much couching it as like, please don't give it to me unless you literally have no one else to give it to. And so but then Alex ended up sending it to me. You had to enter it through the NVIDIA GeForce experience yep. instead of through like Steam or whatever. And then it checked your video card and it would only it only the code only redeems if you have a 3000 series card yeah <laughs> it might do it only for the 3080 and 3090 because it's possible the, the new point, promo is for black ops cold war and that is only for the 3080 and 3090 even though the 3070 oh, just came out that's right huh. i played some zork this week too forgot what? about that how did uh, how did we what, what? how you why said black ops cold war oh. because oh. there was yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. there's a there is currently an ARG for okay. Cold War that has been solved at this point. But mm. if you play Zork for like a half hour and do a few things, you get a bunch of uh, shit for Cold War, <laughs> which again, horrible sure. politics. But my friends and I, it's our chill out game, so we're gonna play it. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. 
I, yeah, I've, so anyway, I've, I played like I've, a half hour Zork. I've Zork sent the rules. code. I've sent the code over to Andre. We'll see what happens. Oh yeah, anyway, oh, we, we can try our team right now. Yeah, the best right game now. I played this week was Zork. <laughs> cool. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, with with that bombshell, Jeff, how about you tell us about uh, Spain and <laughs> Catholicism? I am. Yeah. I am this is going to do, I want you to know before you start and I won't spoil what you're about to tell us about. I can tell you though, that this is going to derail my plans for video games for the rest of the weekend. Cause I have been wanting to squeeze this one in for <laughs> like a year now. Yeah. Sick. Yeah, no, oh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I'm going to start with just some general comments about, uh, the sort of top layer and then we'll dig deeper. It'll be like a layer cake. Uh, so like a tall pie. Yes. Yeah. Oh. No, because that's only one layer. <laughs> and it's all just like apples. one disgusting layer. Apples that look like Cheez Its. Um. So, <laughs> uh, blasphemous. People put Cheez Its in an apple pie, don't they? Is that a thing? I don't know. It, people put, people put cheese on, on pie. Apple yeah. pie. Yeah. Like American cheese. This is gonna be gore all over. Sorry. Me. Sorry. Uh, please. <laughs> Continue, Blasphemous. <laughs> I've heard a lot of really good things about it. Yeah, uh, so Blasphemous is a, a Metroidvania with some Soulsborne influences steeped in Spanish Catholic imagery and metaphysics. In other words, it's the most screwed up game of sorry where you kill the Pope at the end because you're pretty mad at him. Uh, on the surface, uh, it's a really visually striking sprite-driven platformer RPG with an extremely punishing difficulty that doesn't quite uh, stray over the line into I'm going to throw the controller at the wall or anything like that. Um, it's also replete with a soundtrack by Carlos Viola, which sounds like what would happen if Godspeed to Black Emperor recorded an al album in Alhambra after slamming <laughs> down some vermouth, uh, chowing down on entirely too much tapas. Uh, none of that is a dig, by the way. Um, it's a, just a signal that I can't provide any kind of pretense of impartiality uh, when it comes to the soundtrack, because uh, to paraphrase uh, the legendary Junji Ito, this soundtrack was made for me. So uh, <laughs> uh, much of the game has these huge layers of meaning and significance. And the reason why I'm here today is because I think a lot of American players um, are going to miss out on this. And I wanted to sort of clue them in a little bit. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the art, the background politics informing the game, and why everybody has pointy hats that may give you the shivers. Uh, so for those of you who are just looking for a recommendation here, go play it. It's worth it. Do it. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, also, not to begrudge the the performances of the English voice cast. They they I'm sure they did a good job. Well, they kind of did a good job. It's not really the actress' fault. It's the direction. Um, but you really ought to listen to the dialogue in Castilian Spanish, um, even if you don't know Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there, if you do know Spanish, it adds the dimensions of sort of emotional valence that otherwise aren't there. Um, and if you don't know Spanish, it creates a sense of place that um, it just doesn't really happen with the uh, English dialogue as much, at least I found. Again, soundtrack seriously rips. Um, the plot, extremely briefly, and I am condensing deeply here. Um, a suffering penitent boy's prayer is answered, and El Milagro Doloroso, uh, or the uh, Grievous Miracle, as it's called, is summoned into being. Uh, this miracle physically externalizes everyone's grace and everyone's sin. People warp and change physically and mentally according to their grace and sin, according to their moral character, as they're judged by this mysterious miracle. You, the player character, are a member of uh, Brotherhood, the Brotherhood of the Silent Sorrow, who is, uh, this whole Brotherhood has been excommunicated and exterminated, practically, by the Church of Custodia, which is the um, land this takes place in. For reasons that are better explained in the comic book, by the way, there's a comic book. It's pretty cool. Uh, wait, 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 sorry. One comic yeah. book or like a series? Uh, it's just a limited run, uh, okay. like I think mm -hmm. a two-issue comic book. Mm. Uh, but it's still pretty cool. Uh, cool. 
you've been bestowed a sword, a, a very special sword, mea culpa, and you got to go enact the miracle's will, which is probably uh, go kill the Pope, His Holiness, as could I. So that's like a br very brief top. Like I'm glossing a lot. There's a lot more there. There's a lot of lore chunkiness uh, that you get like with Dark Souls or Dandara or something sure. like that. Uh, so the first thing I'll touch on is the art because that's usually the thing that kind of smacks you in the face about this game. This game is visually just evocative. Um, and this is, this is absolutely intentional. Uh, it's steeped in Spanish art history, as well as an art movement from the early 1900s called Dada. Uh, very briefly, Dada originated in Zurich, uh, Switzerland, considered to be an influence of the Surrealist movement, uh, popularized, of course, by Salvador Dali, another Spaniard. Uh, it's primarily about the formation and reappropriation of images in order to disrupt calcified orders, as well as express latent or unheard traumas that were present during the rise of fascism in Europe. Historical examples, if you want to check out data for any listeners, uh, might be uh, Max Ernst, E-R-N-S-T, uh, Un Semaine de Bonté, uh, A Week of Kindness. Um, so if you just search Week of Kindness, or just Birdmen, um, you'll find Max Ernst. Uh, more to the point, though, uh, while the Dada element of the game's aesthetic is in the trauma-laden aspects, there's a lot of deep trauma here. It's, it's a, a, a hallmark of Spanish Catholic art, where you know, in the Germ in the Germanic depictions of Jesus, you get this sort of you know very noble Jesus and what have you, and in Spanish Catholic art, like Jesus is like tortured. He like he's Ugh. it's 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 a whole thing and there's there's a long like centuries of history of portraiture and religious art that kind of depict this and this is absolutely in this game uh but all that being said most of the game's sensibilities in terms of color form composition they just come from one dude francisco de goya so for those of you quick art history lesson uh, Goya, sometimes referred to as the last of the old masters or the first of the moderns. He was a romantic painter who had portraiture down pat, but also pointed, uh, painted some of the most disturbing works of the period. Uh, and they're still unsettling today. Probably his most famous one that most folks I'm thinking would know is uh, Saturn devouring his son, wherein a huge dude who looks like D. Snyder without makeup just noms a smaller oh. dude like he's the worst cookie monster possible. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> that we're not going to take it. And well, I bet he's going to take it yep. <laughs> right into his mouth. Um, so uh, relevant to Blasphemous, though, uh, Goya painted a work called A Procession of Flagellants, which was part of a larger series that illustrated traditions within Spain that more liberal-minded folks like Goya wanted to resist, mock, and abolish. Now, describing pod paintings over a podcast is like a fool's errand here. So Google <laughs> a procession of flagellants and you'll you'll see what I mean. But more to the point, it depicts flagellants in their traditional capirotes or pointed hoods, which brings me to the next point, a brief tangent about clothes, which is relevant to the game for Americans. So you might wonder when you first see the main character, El Penitente, where you're like, hmm, those, those costumes, those character designs, they seem reminiscent of uh, something. Hmm. So here's a fun story. Spain has a tradition going back to at least the 17th century for dressing up for Holy Week. Uh, before then, the caperote was associated with the Inquisition as a way to allude to whatever crimes a person was accused of. Flagellants or penitents would dress up and perform public penance for their sins wearing the capirote and flowy robes, which were usually white with uh, some color splashed on it. Everything was very relatively copacetic until a dude by the name of William J. Simmons needed a particular uniform for his political organization. How he came to this decision is a bit apocryphal. Uh, some say he was nice. inspired by a film by D.W. Griffith uh, called Birth of a Nation, while others tie it to a folk tradition. But the upshot here is that Simon, or Simmons appropriated the Spanish mode of penitent dress for Holy Week to form the uniform of the Ku Klux Klan. Sick. And the moral and creative bankruptcy of the Klan cannot be overstated. 
but I digress. Point here is that the game's character design will probably look alarming to many Americans, but realize it's not actually connected to the clan. It's connected to the traditions of the Spanish Catholic Church, which for many may not be a comfort. <laughs> <laughs> but it which... is at least interesting versus right. I have no interest in engaging with any media that is associated with the clan, except for that part in uh, the sinking city where you get to shoot a lot of them. That's true. That's true. Uh, it's wonderful. So that's actually my favorite part of red dead too. Um, yeah. <laughs> like stumbling on them and like, yes. Or, or, um, or watching black Klansmen and watching that all fall apart. Anyways. Right. That was, that was, that's uh, a good movie, but also there's that part where they're watching birth of nation and you're like, oh, yeah. I hate this. Uh, yeah, very much. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's this fucking Hot <laughs> yeah, that's a good approximation of Goya Saturn devouring a sun, except it's Michelangelo with a pizza slice. I'm that's and I'm gonna see that when I close my eyes tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, La Cowabunga. Uh, so <laughs> there's the episode title. Thank you. You have to send me that image, Andre, please. Okay, thanks. So uh, the, the the idea that the Spanish Catholic Church might not be uh, comforting uh, here brings us to the next point uh, necessary to understand blasphemous in a deeper way. Blasphemous is informed by a particular political discursive space, which can be summed up in a name, La Leyenda Negra de España, uh, or the Black Legend of Spain. This is a hugely controversial topic in Spain, or countries that were or are colonized by Spain. So please note that while my information does come from scholarly sources, again, I can always provide sources there, um, I'm going to have some epistemic limitations here because I wasn't born in Spain. So what is it? Well, it can be summed up, the Black Legend can be summed up as a project of anti-Spanish and anti-Catholic political messaging wherein Spain's Northern European rivals demonize the Spanish Empire, its people, its discoveries, achievements, you name it. It's been described by ethno-historian Charles Gibson as the accumulated tradition of propaganda and Hispanophobia, according to which the Spanish empire is regarded as cruel, bigoted, degenerate, ex exploitative, self-righteous, an excess of reality. And sorry, so here's where it gets for, complicated, though. Yeah. For context, what, what era was that particular bit happening in, more or less? Uh, the Black Legend uh, really kicked off around the... Uh, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> um <laughs> So I cite an example here that's as early as the 16th century. Okay. And then continues all okay, the way cool. forward. But it's complicated, okay. right? So on one hand, the black legend stain is pretty well deserved <laughs> between the conquistadores like Hernán Cortés, Pizarro, the doctrine of terra nullius endorsed by the church, the deliberate spreading of old world diseases, the stealing of land, the comprehensive genocides, plural, uh, yeah, Spain, along with the other colonizing powers of Europe, like in England and Belgium, are absolutely guilty of profound atrocities. But on the other hand, <laughs> there seems to be evidence that other European powers really did try to use disinformation and propaganda to disrupt the Spanish Empire through sight casting them as the worst thing ever. Of note, most of these accusations were super anti-Semitic and racist. Um, which, by the way, keep in mind, uh, the land which was which we call Spain was held by um, emirates and caliphates from the Abbasid and Umayyad dynasties for a really long time. Uh, perhaps the most famous character in this line of thinking is the dude who popularized angry comment sections uh, since 1517, Martin Luther, uh, who said... <laughs> Some pretty nasty things about uh, both Jewish folk and Spanish folk, which I won't repeat here. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of com contemporary defenses of Spain against the Black Legend seem to have the implicit or explicit, explicit premise of, well, you know, like the Spanish Empire was like, was like pretty cool, guys. Um, or it's like an extended to quoque, like you did it first uh, fallacy, which doesn't really work. Uh, but circling back around, I promise this does actually relate. One notable critic of Spanish culture who contributed to the Black Legend, albeit perhaps unintentionally, was an un none other than Francisco Goya, specifically with the painting series that involves a procession of flagellants, which is the painting that inspired Blasphemous. <laughs> uh, Blasphemous is a game that elaborates on a picture of deeply Spanish metaphysics and culture, and it has roots in the Black Legend, in both plot, imagery, song, and design. Hmm. So 
what is blasphemous when we take all this into account? What does this all, the, all this information do for us? Well, first, it makes it, in my opinion, a rarity in modern action RPGs. It's steeped in a specific art history and political tradition. In some ways, there's something similar happening with a sense of origin and blasphemous that's happening in Pathologic 2, though I will also be quick to point out that Pathologic 2 has a much more progressive political undercurrent to it. Uh, second, I think the game's meaning shifts a bit. Um, you are pictured as detritus at the beginning, bare life that has been thrown into this very uh, evocative flesh heap. Uh, the body has been the body that, but the body which has been thrown away, ends up fighting forward anyway. You end up helping the kissers of wounds, or perhaps uh, vanquishing the monstrous agents of the church with such colorful names as Cristanta of the Rapt Agony, Exposito, Scion of Abjuration, or Our Lady of the Blackened Face. Mm. In other words, El Penitente, the Penitent One, is not merely another flagellant in the service to an order gone rampant. El Penitente could be seen as an extension of the desperate torment of those so deeply imbricated in the system who still must resist, who work to overthrow it, who endure their own song of guilt in order to drown out a perverse symphony. In still other words, the Dada impulse of resistance and disruption through targeted appropriation, in El Penitente's case, the appropriation of a proper pilgrimage, which is basically what the game is, ut utilizes the force of trauma to wield a blade against an unjust order. But all of that being said, it could just be a game filled with anime bullshit and weird Catholic stuff. <laughs> so it absolutely, that could be the case. But any Evangelion game. Oh, God. Except <laughs> without, without the, uh, the Freudian schema or the weird attachment to a strange interpretation of Kabbalah. Uh, so... When it yeah. comes to blasphemous, is it contextualizing any of the above uh, in any way, or is it just kind of assuming that you have this inherent knowledge? Um, it's it doesn't go into great depth. Uh, like the black legend is never actually talked about in game. Right. Um, that is all like external research. <laughs> um, but. Uh, it does bring in a lot of specifically uh, the culture of uh, Seville, um, or Seville, um, where the ways that the Spanish Catholic Church has sort of manifested in its emphasis, which is to say on penitence, especially penitence, uh, on the... Uh, sort of visceral feeling of guilt of sin and what that does to the body. Um, so there's all these sort of little clues that if you know the history, it's like, oh, I get it. And if you don't know the history, it's not like you're just locked out of the game and you're like, I don't understand anything that's going on. It's more like this. Is, this seems really fucked up. What's happening? <laughs> I, I would what is going on? I would be so yeah. interested to know just how intentional that is, you know? Right. Like, I would be so yeah. interested to know if it's, if the developers um, were fans of Goya's artwork and had a cursory knowledge of the things that you're describing and then made a really fucking cool looking game out of it, or if there was a deep, a deeper desire to explore these themes you know, like it, it's just, and, and I'm not taking anything away from them either way. Um, but it, I, what I find so fascinating about this game, and I'm really glad I waited to play it until having that education. Cause it's a lot of mm -hmm. stuff that I didn't know, um, is like, I've wanted to play it for a long time because I find the Spanish Catholic imagery, you know, I'm at least familiar with Goya and Goya's works, um, and the procession of the flagellants and stuff. So, um, I, was immediately taken by the game's art style. But I think it's interesting that like, there's all of this potentially eh, interesting either way. Cause if you know this, there's interpretations there regardless of how intentional it is on the part of the developers. But it's also a game I'm looking at the steam page right now. I already own it. I've owned it for like a year and not installed it and played it. But um, 
the the there's there's stuff on the steam page like brutal combat release the power of the mea culpa a sword born from guilt itself to slaughter your foes acquire devastating new combos and special moves as you purge all on your path and you read that kind of stuff and it's like um it's it's interesting and cool this is not a criticism that we're at a place with game development that it could be per perhaps stabbing at these really deep and complex historical themes <laughs> and also that's the marketing on the steam page for it yeah. right like right. It's, it's very exciting to me that there is the potential for that because i think that in the past games i think about we talked about half-life 2 and its anti-fascist themes um Half-Life 2 is a game that I remember blew the doors off of what a game story could be to me when it came out because it was that. It was that, like, and it's one of my favorite games of all time. It was that, like, this is a fucking awesome sci-fi shooter and also that I can say, like, oh, this part in the game is so cool. And then also it has really, at the time, for the time, deep ruminations on these ideas of of, of colonization and conquest and fascism. Um that were pretty heady for video games when that game came out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's interesting to see a game like Blasphemous that is perhaps not at the quality level of Half-Life 2. I haven't played it, I don't know. But it's the way it's marketed is as this like brutal, gory, bloody, violent action RPG that's like hard and all about like mastering combos and stuff, but it might actually have all of this kind of hidden depth from a narrative perspective is, is very cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And to answer your question more completely, um, I'm looking at their clicks, uh, click starter, Kickstarter, click starter is different. Uh, <laughs> and they literally have procession of the flagellants, um, on their artistic inspiration here. Mm -hmm. Um, and they said, uh, We've set ourselves an artistic challenge. Can we create a dark fantasy world that is universally appealing, but also deeply inspired by the most meaningful icons of our local folklore, and then bring go. up the city? Oh, that's really cool. That's great. That's even more exciting to know then. Because, yeah. Because um, I also think just on a purely aesthetic level, not getting deep at all, the fucking, <laughs> the gif of the character, the animated gif of the character putting on the Helm of Penitence and the gushing blood is like mm -hmm. one of my favorite things aesthetically to come out of a video game in it's maybe the last decade. <laughs> yeah, I have been like, using that GIF as a reaction image with a specific <laughs> group of friends who also, one of whom really likes this game, um, as since like before the game came out, just like time to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> right. And what's interesting about the cutscenes is that it's a, it's a throwback to uh, a style of cutscene I've not seen in a minute. Um, does anyone here remember the old Out of This World oh, game yeah. from the oh, yeah. early 90s? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They're like that. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> Except more detailed. It's not yeah. quite, you know, you, there's this weird blocky polar bear guy. Uh, <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> the but uh yeah no it's it's very stirring um and it's there's a actually you know what Here, here's a selling point you can pet the dog there's All a right. dog All right. it's it's a it's a friendly dog you can pet it and it wags its tail and it's your friend cool this the only <laughs> other question that i have um that uh <laughs> This is very specific, but and and and, a, and a little bit silly, but it's also interesting. When I was first looking at the game and thinking about playing it, one of the reasons I didn't just jump on it when it came out is because some of the boss designs, in particular Esposito, Skyon of uh, Abjuration, um, looked like they were almost just going for the like the the sort of shock value of like trying to make you uncomfortable purely through the art do you feel that there is a consistency an, an artistic consistency across like enemy designs and stuff that that feels like tied to the narrative and doesn't just do that isn't just like this is a disturbing image yeah yeah um that's a really good question um i found there to be a thematic consistency okay if only because um i mean expositos 
narrative. Exposito, sorry, yeah, it's not Esposito. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Uh, so Exposito, he he's a little hard to like get the narrative out of because sure. you're trying to collect a bunch of stuff. It, it's it's certainly not a spoiler to describe to you if you if it's on the Steam page. That's that's how I saw it. It's it's basically like this almost wicker looking enemy holding a, a an enormous baby that is crying blood with its eyes wrapped <laughs> uh, and so the thing that, the thing you actually attack isn't that um, okay okay it's a, it, it's a snake with a woman's head oh, uh yeah i see that here as well it's a little left <laughs> yeah yep uh that's a that's a pain in the ass boss uh <laughs> but uh, the lord there is lore there um there's a boss that there's a lot of tree imagery actually there's a lot of wood wood, wood is a huge theme in blasphemous um and it's something that wood, wood gold uh sure. wicker weaving things like that mm-hmm. um so the, i i found the bosses to be to track pretty well Cool. Um, like they're not, they're not just shock value for the sake of shock value. There's, there's a purpose. You kind of have to dig for it a little bit, yeah, that's fine. but yeah. It's and, and it's really a just, it's not even a, like, I'm not going to play it if this isn't there, but it's something like when you look at like, um, and it's a game that I haven't finished. I'm hoping to finish it on the PlayStation five. But, um, when you look at like the cleric beast in bloodborne, that's a very disturbing image, but it also in context the approach to it the fight itself and what comes after feels really really um consistent and and um and like thematically kind of relevant to the world and stuff and it's hard to get a sense for that with some of the 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 just like screen grabs of boss fights that are on in the marketing material so i was just curious it was i was gonna play i'm gonna play either way but i was interested to hear your thoughts on on that Aspect. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it also has a surprising amount of hidden quests and that you can absolutely miss and mess up. And they apparently just released it with, uh, just released a big update for it too called Stir of Dawn. I don't know, if maybe this may have been before you played it. I don't know how recent this update is, but it adds like systems and uh, new story content and new game plus, like all kinds of stuff. So it sounds like yeah. to some extent they are supporting it still, uh, which is cool to see. Yeah, no, and uh, I, I highly support uh, Game Kitchen, which are the developers who made this. Um, they they did also uh, The Last Door, uh, point and click horror adventure, oh. which you would probably really get. I haven't of. played through it, but I am familiar. I've played a little bit of it. Um, that was like, it was originally like, online yeah yes 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 this is a game that was originally browser you could play in a browser um and i've always meant to go back and play through it because i played it before it was finished there was like a demo of it in a browser so yeah right 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 exactly exactly so yeah um yeah i think probably the other uh comment i have about blasphemous and maybe the question i have for for you all because i got to do the teacher thing a little bit uh and then i'll uh (laughs) Let everybody go. Uh, is um, have what game uh, have you played that where the aesthetic didn't just grab you, but it really like you felt it in your gut? I think that's the best way I can describe it. Where you're 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 basically it's like you you were hit with with watching the imagery. Uh, I have if that makes one. sense, I can I can also clarify this if needed. Yeah, one that stood out to me recently, and in very much the same way, in that if you steep yourself in the language and the scenario that it has set up, as well as the visual fidelity, is a game from Asobo Studios, the makers of Microsoft Flight Sim, and also The Crew Two, uh, which was <laughs> they worked pl- on The Crew Two. They were not yeah, the makers of The Crew Two. I know <laughs> they, they were on it, but um, <laughs> have to always was, point that out. <laughs> was uh, Plague Tale. Uh, the one set mm. in revolutionary France. My partner and I want to play that so bad. <clears throat> I have it sitting on my Xbox. Sorry. Yeah, but it's very similar to this in that, like, it doesn't contextualize the French Revolution and whatever. Like, it doesn't contextualize everything or like the plague. I should say, sorry, uh, like the Black Plague and all that junk. It doesn't contextualize it. It just you're just kind of thrown into that world, assuming you understand it. And if you don't understand it, it's probably fine. Uh, I played through the entire game in French, but French is also my native language. So uh, I didn't like 
it was actually really interesting playing it that way. I would be interested in hearing how it is for someone who does not speak French and just listening to the French voice acting because it's very good. Well, and we would emotional. definitely play it in French with subtitles. So I will, yeah, I will and, let you know. So yeah, that aesthetic in, it was up until the last couple hours, I would say it was very evocative of what it would actually be like if you were in that scenario. The last few hours I wasn't as fond of because it went very fantastical. <laughs> Um, like it, it, it broke away from anything that you would actually see in reality and that kind of broke it for me. But up until that point, like when you're walking around in a moody, uh, like cityscape with all the doors with red X's painted on them with a torch and you're just like, there's no natural or no, uh, artificial light. The only light is coming from your torch and you're looking around these areas and there's like rats scuttling around. Like that's pretty effective. So yeah, Plague Tale Innocence is definitely the one that comes to mind for me. Nice. What do you think, Allison? Uh, I'm still thinking about it. Maybe pass. Andre? Uh, yeah, it's like a difficult thing. Like off the top of my head, uh, Sayonara Wild Hearts. Like mm. when I saw that trailer, like mm. I was just very into the art um, and like that aesthetic. And like the, that is the kind of music I'm into lately is like the more poppy ethereal pop kind of stuff uh which was like really great i saw that and i was like holy shit why did no one tell me about this in the thing because i was asleep during the nintendo direct <laughs> and it was like you know everyone was chatting about it and i read through and i was like okay and then i watched it later I was like, oh, oh my god i need to play this um and then it's not out but it's like a thing that just always gets me is like pacific northwest or like specifically oregon like aesthetic stuff uh, and Lake, which is coming out supposedly Q1 2021, uh, you're uh, like visiting, you're a lady visiting a town in Oregon. I think it's a fictional town, uh, Providence Oaks. And you're like being a mail carrier for two weeks. And like, I think there's like a murder or something and you're like trying to solve it, I guess. I don't know. Just you're saying. just like going around doing mail stuff and, like I watched the trailer and like I had tears in my eyes. Uh, part of that is like homesickness, but like any, like seeing the trailer for, um, what, what was it? Uh, days gone. Like, I'm like, Oh, yep. Okay. Those forests. I like, they're like fictionalized, but like, I know those forests, I know that look. And then like, same with games, like, uh, life is strange too. Uh, that was also a thing like, okay, I've been to like these kinds of areas. So anything like in that kind of vein always gets me. Thanks. Nice. nice. Pat, what you got? So I have a, a few, I won't talk for 20 minutes, but so that Allison has a little bit more breathing room. I have a few quick hit answers and then a couple that are more, more uh, impactful. But um, I would say uh, when it, when it, when I first played brutal legend, that was one that I was like, as a fun <laughs> kind of fun, really though, like as a fun one, yeah. that was one of the first times that I felt like a video game didn't just do a, a fantasy or sci-fi aesthetic and also really like spoke to me. Um, I remember the, um, like playing that game's opening sequences and the way that it uses like its soundtrack and the aesthetics of heavy metal album covers. It was just so clear that they got it. It wasn't a joke to them. It wasn't a gimmick, but also they got the absurdity of like a, yeah. a, a fucking throne of skulls on the cover of an Ozzy Osbourne album or whatever. Like it was so cool the way that they got like, cause heavy metal is so like, people who are big fans of heavy metal know what parts of it are silly and what parts of it are serious, yeah. but you still kind of ride this blurred line, be line between it, where if you're a big fan, you take some of the silly stuff a little more seriously, even though you understand why people outside of that scene don't get it as mm. much and think it's funny. So like, like that was a, cool. Like a Dio album cover. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. When I see Dio album covers, I genuinely love them, <laughs> but mm. I understand why some people think they can be stupid. Uh, and, and clearly brutal legend got that, um, dark souls huge in terms of like, it's my favorite style of fantasy art is the, 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 the dark, the low fantasy that those games specifically evoke. Um, which is also a big part of why I am so excited to play blasphemous because there's a little, little bit of crossover there. Um, uh, pathologic one, way back when I first found out about it. Um, the, it is not a pretty game. It's very ugly in terms of its, its technical visual and, and art design, 
but the crushing weight of that game's aesthetic and art style, which is true of Pathologic 2 as well, I just experienced it first in the first game, is uh, fascinating. And it's like, don't play, maybe don't play that game in 2020. I'm planning to play it before the end of the year, but it is a deeply disturbing, uh, upsetting and challenging thing to play. And I don't mean from a difficulty perspective. Um, uh, but then the two that are, uh, or the few that, that are, that are really big for me, the first time I saw the no man's sky trailer, obviously the shipped game, it only now kind of truly evokes that trailer after years of work. But the first time I saw the no man's sky trailer, I just about cried because it combined a, uh, 65 days of static is a band that I already really yeah. liked and that kind of post rock sound, uh, put together with what is, I mean, uh, sort of high, hard science fiction is one of my favorite aesthetics, you know, the seventies book cover, which Sean Murray specifically cited as the inspiration for the art in no man's sky. Um, and, and so to see all that laid out with that kind of music, um, and the possibility space there was really impactful to me. Um, I would say most recent example, Control definitely hit me that way um, in a way that I didn't expect because I didn't understand how much I love brutalism until I played Control. <laughs> that was like the <laughs> that was like the the switch that made me go, wait a minute, this is why I always thought the FBI building was the coolest building in Washington D.C., <laughs> even though it's yeah, ugly. <laughs> brutalism and Will Scarlet from yeah, Robin Hood um, Men Tights, but. I think probably the most visceral reaction I've had purely based on aesthetic to a game ever, which ties into control is, um, in Alan Wake, uh, there is a moment at the end of, I think it's like the second episode at this point, the game has been established as a amalgam of twin peaks and Stephen King, uh, and, um, and even other kind of more disparate, uh, horror themes, which is already a thing that I really dig. And then um, there is the moment where uh, the, I forget the name of the character, but she's on the, she does, she makes the phone call at the end of the second episode. And then it starts playing Pose Haunted, which is one of my oh. favorite songs of all time. And no one knows that song. <laughs> like, I think I, I ex people on this podcast maybe, but for the most part, Poe is like this forgotten relic. Like, Sometimes like a signpost in the desert, somebody mentions Poe and I'm like, yeah, Poe yeah, fucking the guy who wrote, ruled. Uh, the guy who wrote House of Leaves, his sister. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so the to hear that song play after a moment that was so deeply like my kind of weird horror stuff and, and the sort of Twin Peaks, it was a very Twin Peaks moment combined with that song was like, I, it got my blood pumping so hard and uh, it was really, really, really a really, really cool moment. Um, I've had more emotional Rose? moments with games before, but from a purely aesthetic perspective, I think that's the one that hit me the hardest. I, I've nice. just been thinking about Alan Wake. Is that, was it Rose that made the phone call? Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, she calls from the like cabins and like Barry is calling to set something up. And the reveal is that the, the scary, the woman, uh, the writer's wife, who's like the the like apparition, is yeah. behind her and kind of yeah. is like possessing her um, or or you know controlling her. That's the right. that's the moment, and then the then the post song plays. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Rose. Anyways, cool. So Allison, what you got? Yes. All right. So I actually figured it out. So because I was I was really kind of stuck on the kind of um, you know things that are familiar to you in real life, which I don't know if I've really had that much. Um, but one of the things that uh, really influenced me, um, just like kind of my aesthetic style and my aesthetic um, things that I like are Studio Ghibli movies. Um, like I oh, saw yeah. I saw Spirited Away in theaters when I was like 11, I think. And then after that, I was like immediately hooked and went and watched every single movie I could get my hands on and watch pretty much everything and, and loved it um, around that age and it was really formative. <clears throat> um, so the two ones that come to that are obviously uh, Nino Puni, which I still haven't played that much of. Like I've played a little bit of it, but I haven't really dug deep into it. But just seeing that aesthetic art style in a game the first time I saw it was just like, I don't know. It, it felt very much like, oh, you can play 
as as in the movie. Um, and the other one that's a little bit less direct, but still kind of gave me that same vibes was the original um, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild trailer, which mm. just like something about the music and the kind of nature aesthetic just gave me like just these really great vibes of, of that. So um, that's something that always, if, if something is kind of Studio Ghibli reminiscent in any way, it'll just make me go like, yes, please uh, take my money. <laughs> Right, right. No, that makes sense. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Sorry for, for taking up a little bit more time, Andre, but at the oh, same time, no. like... It's no. interesting. Well, it's good. Uh, there, there, it's one of those things where, like, being aware of what can viscerally pull at you can, like, also, like, change the way that we engage with media, right? Totally. And, like, the more that yeah. we're aware, aware of that, uh, like, in my case, I'm a huge sucker for Spanish culture. Uh, like, I... I and anytime you put anything into Lusian, I'm like, okay, let's go. <laughs> Sign me yeah. up. Have my money. It's it's interesting <clears throat> to find like those kind of little uh, pressure points, and then also when you do get them pushed, it's it's just super exciting. Like for me, I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily aesthetic, although I love the aesthetics of the game. Um, but uh, containing continuing my Hades love of mm. 2020, just like uh, I grew up. Greek mythology was like so huge to me growing up to, I, I, I feel like I've probably talked about this before, but there was a good chunk of my childhood where I literally listened to Greek mythology tapes falling asleep every single night. Um, so it's, it's just like viscerally being like, it's that guy. I know who you are. Oh boy. It's i uh, I'm sure ready. And like having something that's like, so, directly not just like taking the aesthetic of it but taking the actual stories and actual characterizations and everything and just kind of like going deep on it was just really super exciting for me and still kind of th is thrilling whenever i pick it up and go. i kind of only didn't list any super giant games on when i was talking because i have <laughs> they've kind of damned themselves to a degree because i think they're perhaps um one of the most impressive studios from an aesthetic and art direction standpoint oh, yeah. oh, totally. that exists ever in the history of games. So the artwork for like the promo or like the main artwork for Transistor is like maybe my favorite piece of oh, game oh, that's so art good. What's, ever. What's funny is that while I certainly feel an emotional connection to pretty much all of their art, I don't have that like gut punch reaction to it simply because I kind of expect it. <laughs> like yeah, it's, they always meet or exceed my expectations, but if, it's when I saw the Hades art, I was like, that's fucking rad. But I, I also, when I saw the super giant logo expected to be blown away by something, you I know, feel so like it didn't though, have that emotional like gut punch that you were asking about. It's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that, I think that I get that. I like, I aesthetically, I don't know if I've, I get it always, but it's like, I feel like definitely some of the music and some of the, um, which I'm sort of considering as part right. of the aesthetic, you know? Yeah. And like just the, uh, so, so really, I feel like the biggest gut punch from super giant might have been the first time you, I played bastion because sure, right. you're not expecting it. And yeah. then you have the narrator and it's just aesthetically, you have this music, you have the narrator who is just like legendary. And I, I played a little bit of, uh, of bastion, uh, a while ago because I was like, so in Hades that I'm like, I should just play some other game. Let's just play another super tiny game. Yeah. <laughs> well, and Darren's my favorite composer in games right now. Yeah. So, oh, uh, and, and like, uh, there was a, a super giant put a, posted a video on their Twitter of, um, the voice actor who is, uh, among other things, the narrator in Bastion, but he's basically oh, been in Logan. every single super giant game. Yeah. And Logan Cunningham. Yeah. Yes. And it was like, dude you're you're such a talent <laughs> he, he is it's so you're funny amazing. in person i haven't met him but i was I, I was uh fortunate enough to attend the their 10 years of super giant at pax a couple of years ago or last year i guess it was um that daniel dwyer hosted and uh they were all that was like gen z was there greg Kasavin was there logan, logan was there there were um a couple other people were there um aram was there i think uh and Logan's funny because he's simultaneously like seems very approachable and is also like s super imposing at the same time. Like 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 a not imposing like not on purpose. I don't. I think he's ex he seemed extremely nice on the panel, 
but he also is such like a a, a like force in the room yeah that it's oh like, i bet it's like I really want to go talk to that person because they seem very warm and friendly, but also I really need to get it together before I do because <laughs> they're also, he's also like just sort of a, a, a monolithic figure <laughs> in the room as well. He's yeah, a really cool, yeah. I mean, really I feel cool. like he could just an astounding talent in his like narrator from Bastion voice and everybody would just be like, transfixed I mean, he voices hades poseidon achilles charon asterius and the storyteller which is <laughs> fucking bananas because some of those are so so different yes. and you're just like what the fuck are you doing yeah anyway hades tangent absolutely yeah uh, I, hades tangent is like my subtitle for 2020 <laughs> in terms of video games because like Honestly, any any week that I don't bring up Hades, assume that I played at least a few runs of Hades. <laughs> Even though I, no. I hit the true ending like weeks ago at this point. I bet they made to get it. You know, you know, sometimes you gotta check in with old friends. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. Good. And it's just just like feels super cozy to play at this point because I've played so much of it, so and there's still stuff to do, so right. And there's still stuff I'm on it. I'm unlocking, and there's still stuff where you're like, "Well, I haven't gotten all of the companions yet. I haven't. I have nowhere come close to all the fish yet." Uh, <laughs> considering, oh yeah, there's a fishing mini game in this, <laughs> this big game. So yeah, it's it's there's a lot. Um, but yeah, that that I think that's that's one of them too. Uh, probably the most visceral experience this year was was Hades for sure. Thanks. All right. Well, with that, we're getting long. Uh, Alex, do you want to talk hey. about Umineko again? Yeah, absolutely. Because I got to a part in that game that just got fucking buck wild, and I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to spoil it. Um, okay, moving on. Yeah, no, uh, moving on. No, uh, one thing I should say, <laughs> that game is on sale right now uh, for 50% off, and everyone should buy it because it's extremely good. It's part of the Halloween sale. Um, uh, I really need to play that <laughs> soon. <Yeah. laughs> Especially hearing just the basic stuff about um, how you're starting to see why people were so excited and overanalyzing the Higurashi, the new opening to Higurashi. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, now I'm just like, oh, I got to know. Yeah. Wait, but you have to buy the two parts separate to buy the questions and the answer. That's $30 total. Mm -hmm, yep. I see. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a whole uh, lot of it, sto story it should in there, be, though. It should be noted. The questions are, it took me 68 hours to get through. <laughs> and Which I'm is currently... either like a, a something to bring you in or something to make you... Mm. Yeah, the dangerous... Like... Sorry, go ahead. No, go for it. The dangerous. The dangerous thing I realized, I had started reading the manga, which is very good. The first volume. Well, we won't get into it. There's some stuff with the writing that I skews me out and I'm fucking sick of. But that's that's a personal journey I've been going on this year with my anime consumption or, or anime aesthetic consumption. But um, the uh, generally, it's really well done. Um, the, the art is really great. Most of the writing is really great. Uh, but I realized in all of my hemming and hawing about how I would love to play the visual novel, except I want to play it on iPad. It's a visual novel. I could steam stream it very easily. Mm, yeah. Uh, because the, the steam link app for iOS isn't great, but it works totally fine for clicking through a visual novel. So there's really no reason that I would, there's no real reason to read the manga over playing the game aside from just the different, delivery method i can use the same device to play both so i may pick it up we'll see yeah i don't think no. i'd get through it until probably 2022 but yeah, it, after it's you've a, completed it's, the trails and the trail trail of cold steel that's the one yeah that's a, so, that'll always be a background thing I, I have no there are no illusions there that i'll get through that anytime soon <laughs> i've i have not promised to such anything sam says the contrary is bullshit <laughs> I probably won't play Trails of Cold Steel 1 until 2024. <laughs> if then. Um, if, if then. So one thing I'll say about Umineko, and now that I'm relatively close to the end, like I'm about halfway through the answers arc, um, which probably leaves me with about 30 or 35 hours to go. I don't know. Maybe the last chapter or last episode will be extremely long. 
who can say um i find it there's eight episodes is what they're called and each episode is about 15 ish hours plus or minus two we'll say um and i would say each of those feels like you're reading a book in a series so if you think of it that way it's like you're reading an eight part series uh in with eight different books and uh, it just happens to be that these books are they have a soundtrack they have voice acting like voice acting for every spoken line uh they have actually if you if you use the the ps3 patch because there was a patch or a ps3 version which had really really high fidelity art and animations there is a for the pc version you can get a patch which puts all those in and like fixes all of the uh cut scenes and stuff to not have spoilers because the steam version does <laughs> and things like that like yeah you're reading a really high fidelity book in a really high fidelity series of books and by the point i'm at which is like yeah episode seven ish it's fucking nuts like the narrative just is completely subversive in a way i never would have expected even though i know his works i know what he's capable of <laughs> uh it became a total subversion of tropes from both the mystery genre and the fantasy genre in a way that i was not expecting and it's really cool like uh in a non-spoilery way there is something that's happening on a surface level like with these characters who are interacting one-to-one -one, they're speaking there's a murder mystery involved and they're trying to figure everything out and like it's freaking them out it's horror based and all that uh hence why it's in the halloween sale and then there's a meta layer above that and the recent reveal is that there's a meta layer above the meta layer <laughs> which is meta -meta meta layer yeah it is executed extremely well and even saying that isn't a spoiler because once you get there you'll just be like what is even happening in a very good way so uh we don't have to talk about umineko too much longer because uh it's still not done and we've been talking about it for almost a month now uh i, I, I do believe the first time you talked about it you said you wouldn't talk about it every week <laughs> yeah but it turns out it's really good and i think it's up there as maybe my favorite piece of media i've ever consumed so oh so I you're becoming one of those umi neko people i am becoming one of those because i think those people <laughs> i mean i don't mean it in a bad way i just mean that if you people... could even call them people <laughs> i don't mean it in a I just mean it that people who like Umineko really like Umineko. Yeah, they they proselytize it from the roofs, and I think I'm almost getting to that point. Like it's it's Alex nuts. is considering buying a house just so he can have a roof to stand on. Exactly, precisely. So it's worth experiencing. I would say uh, we can leave that there. <laughs> okay, I'll check it out. Well, then. Uh... We're going to kind of transition into the news, then you can kind of talk about this thing you wrote. Sure. Uh, because they're intimately linked. Uh, so that's it for game talk. And we'll have probably, we're not going to cover all this news, I don't think. It's not enough it's hours not in the podcast. Anyway. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, so the main thing that we're going to talk about today is Cyberpunk 2077. It went gold, everybody. It was. It was ready to ship. It's out in like three weeks, less than three weeks now, right? It's going to be great. No more delays. Yep. They, uh, except they are delaying it again. Yep. Uh, only like three weeks or something? Not even not three even more weeks long. of overtime, baby. Three more weeks of crunch. Yeah. There What's was some three sentiment. Weeks when you've been crunching for a year <laughs> or two, as it may be. Uh, on and off um there's some like people i saw some folks saying that like oh this is a good thing because it gives the developers more time to so that they can reduce their workload in that time and it's like that's not how this works no. <laughs> they're going to no. be working those overtime hours until the thing's out and, and probably they would be no it's, they'd be that's... working those hours anyway that's a common because... misconception is yeah it, when when yeah. the date comes it's not like they stop they keep going yeah it, yeah like, there's there's patches it, which there's is patches, kind of what the, i mean yeah after this, support, all this work is on the day zero patch i saw some ridiculous thing from somebody on their team one of their management talking about metacritic scores and how they aim for yeah. over 90 with all their games and it's like there's clear that that it's 
I love CD Projekt Red games. They're... I'm willing to say it out loud. Like the Witcher series is one of my favorites, but their management is a complete there's... disaster. <laughs> there's yeah. so much to unpack here. Um, it's the... so bad. The developers learned at the same time that the public did about this delay. Yeah. Um, like, <laughs> yeah, they basically found through, out on Twitter, some of them. There, though they there, did, was, they, there was an email, there was an email at the same well. time. But, but yeah. yeah, it was the same time, uh, not even like a heads up, after like the day before social media being like, no more delays. <laughs> Which, this well, isn't the, an excuse for that. It's certainly no. not a... I'm not. I'm not saying that this is okay, that it's okay or good. Clearly, yeah. they're aware that there are people there that are talking with folks like Jason Schreier and stuff. Um, yep. And so, I'm sure they figured if they sent an email, it would be minutes before that that ended up reported on by yeah maybe. outside so, yeah. sources. Which um, just more goes to show how fucked your whole production is if you have to worry mm-hmm. about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm just. I'm just gonna say, as much as their management sucks, their PR is severely fucking their entire studio. Oh yeah, like yeah. severely. Like I, it, with if, with the example you gave, oh, yeah. Andre, because like you said, oh, no more delays. Like they, if you go back on their Twitter and look at it, it's like, yeah, no delays, no coming. There's like that example everyone cites of, oh, I took time off for the for the uh, launch of this game. Can you can you guarantee me there's no more delays so that I'm not taking this time off in vain? And they're like, yeah, 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 no problem. It's coming out that date. Like guarantee, no problem. I, and that was 12 that was hours the, before this delay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was like right before I mean, they announced the delay. You know, the PR person is just like, yeah, the, the game's coming out. Because as far as they know, it is. And yeah. then yeah. suddenly management's like, nah, you got to you gotta tweet this out. Yeah. Like, but like, oh, okay. not to say the person behind it is fucking them. <laughs> yeah, the, P, yeah, yeah. the PR is fucking them. Like, yeah. Just, right. Yeah. Like, and and like, if, if, if somebody saw that they posted that, there, there should be somebody going, Hey, FYI, maybe don't make promises if you don't know. Well, or, um, like just don't uh, make promises. On but. the other hand, it did go gold, so they were they were yeah. they there was stuff from their management claiming that they weren't going to crunch on the project to get some kind yeah. of like brownie points, I guess, <laughs> while they were crunching on the project. Like it was just a lie. Yeah. And yeah. It's like all the reporting that I have heard that's not specifically related to the labor angle, which is for sure more important, but like they were in pre-pro, they, sh- they showed that opening announcement teaser, whatever, six years ago. It was like before Seven, The Witcher 3 I, came out. Oh, it was before um, The Witcher 3 was like announced. <laughs> That was, it was how they said, hey, we're working on The Witcher 3. This is just what's coming out. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what, Witcher seven, eight years ago, okay. something like that? Yeah. They kind basically like, were in pre production like for. Yeah. They were in pre production for like four to six years or something, working mm-hmm. stuff out, and basically have been. And this could be wrong. I mean, this could be bad information. So, I'm not trying to state this as fact. But from what I've heard, um, they have basically been crunching on the production part of this game for the past couple of years. <laughs> Uh, and not all of it was made in that time, obviously, like they, they didn't just throw it together in two years, but like it, it has not been inactive. Like it has not been, um, there was such a long pre-production period that, that like they're building this massive game in such a short amount of time. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it, it is obviously going to have an impact on their ability to like <laughs> produce it on a timeline. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's bad. I almost am like i think the key thing to segue to your article alex is this is should be used as a springboard for conversation about the wider problem with games game development and labor associated with it um because cyberpunk is fucked cdpr is fucked there's not really much that can be done at this point to save the people working on this specific project right on this specific game it's it's i mean there's still a few weeks but it's like there's it's pretty much done like, yeah i mean yeah uh yeah they're not they're not going to change anything to to make it better at this point uh there with yeah. that stuff but um but i think it should be used as a as an opportunity to talk about the issue more broadly yeah which alex wrote an article about yeah, and it's a long um, article. Fixed dot space. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll I'll make sure to include a uh, link in the show notes. But it is a huge problem, y'all. <laughs> like yeah. it's 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 not just CDPR. Uh, right. No. Oh, and yeah, no. like it's they not just are not... CDPR. It's not just Rockstar. It's not just like any of the big studios. It's it's or like just an individual big studio. It's big studios. It's a lot of little studios too. It's I mean, big. 
problem. Look at Necro Barista, right? Like yeah. in that in the case of that game's development, you had a team of friends who have more equity, so they are not necessarily deserving of the same kinds of criticism for management harming people working under them because they're more of a collective and more of a, a flat structure. But mm -hmm. they've been open about how much burnout affected that game's development. So yeah. it's mm -hmm. clearly across the spectrum of from small to large. Yeah. And it's it's just inherent to the industry at this point, which is a bad thing. Like it's it's difficult because how do you how do you fix that when it's like rotten at the root, you know? Right. Like, and might I say it's also inherent in capitalism? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because well, I mean, I mean, I like I've worked like like my previous job. I was working. I wasn't a project manager, but I was working kind of in adjacent with project management and basically specifically, um, you know, assigning resources and doing it. And there were times I had to ask people to work late, and it was solely because we didn't have the resources to, you know, to do things like it was okay, we don't have enough people based in uh, Europe to do this. So can you do this? Or we don't have enough people based in America who can do this. So, hey, person in France, can you do this like late your time? And it's like, it sucks, but it's like also like because capitalism, because they understaff there because you know it, there's just like all these like kind of compounding reasons why people do this and it's like i feel like a lot of it kind of comes down to well you know we we don't want to have to pay more people to do these do things ergo people are yeah. gonna which yeah which i think is valid and i think it's kind of unrelated to what happens in games because it's not entirely unrelated but it's not. I mean, also, it's not. It's not also not a one-to-one -one mapping. I guess people want right. their return on their investment. They, you know, they need money to come in to fund the studio. And if, you know, we need the money now, I, CD Projekt Red's probably okay with how The Witcher's been doing. Um, <laughs> yeah. But right. and you know, and their business as like a storefront. Um, but you know, there comes a point where like you do need to put a thing out. But, but that's more because of how the economy and capitalism and stuff have been and like, structured a, and re require like a product to be put out there within some reasonable time frame. Well, and capitalism has begotten a, a, a culture of consumption that demands that CD project put this game out because people demand it. Like, even if you remove the aspect of capital from it because of that, because of the influence of that structure, we expect like, when's the game going to come out? The game's going to come out, right? When's it, the game's coming out now, right? In, well, in, in theory, sort of to yeah. points well, you've brought up, Alex, you should, deadlines should be set because you as a creative team need to set deadlines to be able to put a pin on something rather than to hit a revenue goal. Um, sure. and, and, and you can't that, do that in the culture that we live in. Because and and, and I mean, I'll, also like, like kind of tying it together too with the people who are... Um, taking time off to play uh, Cyberpunk when it comes out and are frustrated that it's delayed. It's like, you know, it's, it's in a capitalist society where a lot of jobs aren't necessarily flexible about days that you can take off. There's and a so lot of angles be, on it for sure. Right. Yeah. So it's like, there's definitely a lot of angles and it's not just that, but at the same time, like, it, it, like the more that I think about it, the more I'm like, hmm. Those people can read a book. Yeah. yeah, but like they, the they thing can go is, read a cyberpunk book, like uh, right. Necro, but I mean, it's not just like Rista, but what's the that, that William adds Gibson, like, <laughs> like a layer <laughs> of <laughs> pressure. Yeah, but like to to your point, Pat. Like yes, in general, but specifically for cy cyberpunk, they first said April sixteenth, twenty twenty. Then they said mm -hmm. September seventeenth. Then the nineteenth of November, and then now it's the tenth of December. Like they're the ones that are setting those dates that people are like looking at like and they're expecting the thing to come out so like i think that's a little bit different than saying like oh i'm excited for this thing to come out i need it to come out right now Rah. let like, me that's... tell you about the elden ring subreddit <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair and like like you have games like um the last guardian where like you know it was announced a billion years ago and then finally like people people cared about it and like they wanted it to come out but they were like, oh, is it going to show up at E3 again? We really want to hear more news about this. 
Uh, and then finally they put a date on it. Like that's what finally sets the final expectation of, Oh, now I want this product cause I know it's a thing and it will be releasing yeah. at this point. Like, yeah, I think that does raise a different mentality than just being excited about something and wanting it to come out, I guess. At least yeah. for me. I, I, I think they're getting death threats from people. Yeah, that part is Because they dumb. won't release the game. And that, that stuff, that toxicity yeah. is largely bred from the kind of entitlement that comes with the culture of consumption that has developed around and been influenced by capitalism, in my opinion anyway. Um, because in a, in a better world, we would say, I'm really excited for this piece of art that you're creating. And when you're ready and to give it to me, I'm, I'm, I can't wait, but take your time and do what you think, you know, manage the project the way that's best for you and the health of your team and yourself. Uh, yeah. But we don't do that because they put a date on it and everyone expects to be able to buy it. And then everyone's like, well, I'm giving you money. So I deserve, I, I you owe me and I own you because, because I'm paying you for this product. And yeah, like they don't um, give yes. a shit about your $60. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. it seems to come from a place of entitlement, but also just a absolutely prof a profound lack of understanding of how games are made, which is or also just human kind of, empathy or, or, yeah. or empathy, but like, that's kind of what the article I wrote tries to address. Yeah. Is Which I think actually, is why it's it's very effective uh, yeah, it, like, because it, it does look, it looks very mechanically at the problem. And I appreciate that you took, um, you, you, you took a clear stance of like, Hey, this is bad in games and didn't really leave room for argument against that, but also outlined very mechanically why this stuff happens the way that it does. Um, so I think it's a very useful it's a useful counterpoint, I think, to the reporting that's generally pretty condemnatory without necessarily providing context, um, which then creates this sort of desire from people, I think, to fight back against that commentary and talk about how, like, you know, almost throw off the notion that crunch is bad and or, or that game design crunch in particular is bad to defend developers who now feel embattled. And it's just not a lot of the way that it's reported on is, is challenge is creates a sort of back and forth dialogue that isn't actually helpful to <laughs> examining the problem itself. Yeah. Not that it shouldn't be reported on either. I'm not saying that, but yeah. Yeah. It, um, and one fun, fun is a really weird word to use, but an interesting thing that came out of that article was I posted it to the coding blocks, Slack coding blocks being podcast all about, uh, developers mm -hmm. and yeah. stuff like that. We had, had Joe Zach. Zach. Yeah. yeah. We had Joe Zach as a guest at one point. Um, we were talking about the PS5 and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I talked about it because I've been a part of their Slack for a couple of years now and posted that article. And so many developers in <laughs> uh, came out and talked about crunches they've experienced uh, with their workplace, not in games, some in games. And like, it's been a really interesting dialogue to see because all of the people are saying, yeah, this is, this is the thing that people aren't vocalizing and yeah. it need, it needs to be vocalized at some point because people are getting really aggressive yeah. without understanding um w like objectively what's happening yeah <laughs> like they're, they're, they're being fantastical with it almost they're like oh games kind of like you put in quote unquote effort and then they come out you're not putting in enough effort it's like, no, there's a lot more to it. <laughs> I think there's a danger to not to take away from the personal experiences of any particular developers either, but like with all things that are um, sort of um, manipulative and, and kind of harmfully, uh, I, I think the term gaslighting here is really appropriate. Yeah. Um, you can work in an environment, I say as someone who has been through this, where the crunching and the overtime, and this was from a um, IT perspective, so kind of adjacent, but not directly dev, um, where I believed that what that my crunching was for the good of the company, and it was mm -hmm. a good thing, and that it was just the way it was. So I think there can be a danger where when you are inside of that environment, where you're kind where you kind of justify it. Um, and it's not that I was necessarily concerned about that with your article, because I think you're a very like analytical Thanks. person, but I think what your article does that is very strong is it is it's presenting a lot of objective truths without, um, without doing that thing, without like saying, here's my perspective as a developer, 
but then also stating a bunch of stuff that's very arguable from the outside. That's kind of like, I don't want to tell you what's best for you, but you've also kind of been manipulated into thinking this is okay, which mm -hmm. is what happened to me. <laughs> and I didn't really understand it until I was no longer in that industry and in that space. And it's not even because the people that were at the top of that particular company were bad people. I think genuinely mm -hmm. that they're good people, but it's just because of the systems in place and because of the realities of, um, you know, broadly capitalism, but directly so a lot of these industries, good people are led to build sort of a toxic culture uh, around overwork without really realizing what they're doing. And then everyone's suddenly all in on it without getting it. And I think yeah. Jeff had thoughts too, and is making yeah. a face that is like, Ooh. No, go for it, yeah. Please. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so this is everything, What wh how people are sort of conceiving of this, um, it tracks a lot of the stuff that we talk about in political uh, philosophy quite a bit. Um, so first point, um, everyone should go read Alex's article. And, and I say this as a person who analyzes arguments for a living. It's, it's a really cogent article uh, that gets at the, the core of things, uh, especially with crunch culture, really well. Um, so everyone should go read that. Uh, two... Uh, precarity, uh, which is uh, what I heard Allison uh, talking about uh, as a as a condition and a consequence of capitalistic uh, mechanisms and procedures. There is something about precarity, which especially manufactured precarity, that uh, changes people. It changes workplaces. It changes environments. It changes the way that we demand and that we think, uh, especially when we're in a precarious position. Uh, as a as a person who is currently in a precarious position, because I'm in academia uh, and the, the culture, there's there's many parallels between game development and academia, <laughs> where they rely they feed on your passion, um, <laughs> like vampires. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, so there's 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 the precarity condition where uh, just to be clear, precarity refers to uh, the state of being where uh, you're on the edge of uh, something drastic, something horrible happening, something. Uh, it's where a lot of Americans are. It's where a lot of people all over the world are. Where it you know you're one paycheck away from just completely being homeless that's precarity and capitalism and in addition to neoliberalism has this way of going about things uh the thing that pat was talking about in his three is kind of interesting too because it means like okay uh there is a thing that uh, actually mentioned by uh michel foucault where uh we we kind of know it as you know the panopticon and what have you and think about jails but the thing is, is that the really insidious thing about surveillance, jail, carceral culture, and capitalist culture, when they all start to dovetail, is precisely what Pat just described, which is your boss doesn't have to supervise you and surveil you. They will. They, pro they probably feel like they need to exercise, exercise that power. But most of the time, they don't have to because you do it to yourself. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's part. That's part of the whole deal. I mean, Althusser even talks about this with interpolation, where we, like uh, imagine a cop or a boss saying, "Hey, come here. You know, are no longer the self that you are at home. You're no longer the self that you are when you're a child or when you're with friends. You are suddenly I'm an employee or I'm Whoa. a criminal." Yeah. The and thing is, like, it changes. You're, you're, you're yeah. totally right. Like, and speaking with academia versus software development, like something I've seen personally and from stories I've heard from friends as well is like people who spend all night in the office so they can, you know, sleep in the office, wake up and be there in the morning uh, so that they can continue. Uh, I have had friends who have worked at EA um, and like a couple of them basically rented a trailer, like an RV trailer kind of thing that they basically like parked in the parking lot of the office so they could be closer to the workplace. And it wasn't one person who did that. It was because it was a collective unit. Like it, it, it became normalized for them. They're like, mm -hmm. yeah, more multiple people are doing this. Uh, totally. Let's do this. Let's be excited about it. Let's do this. And they don't realize how toxic that is to themselves. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, it's right. not a, it's not necessarily a lack of self-respect. It's potentially a lack of foresight and critical thinking, which like I've been there, uh, especially in academia yeah. there. I've spent many nights, uh, you know, hundred percent like staying up, all night doing stuff just because <laughs> just because of momentum kind of stuff but like not being like okay i should take a break and rest mm -hmm. 
uh, just because like my roommate was doing it at the same time. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, this is normal. Let's do this. So. Well, and the part of the problem with that, and this is true of artistic pursuits, it's true of a lot of, you know, it's true of, you know, whether you're a developer, if you're working on medical software, if you're in academia, it's true. It was true in my experience, what it was is I was working in an IT environment, getting kids hardware and, and software infrastructure and network infrastructure for learning. And you care, you, I came to care about it. I, I was really passionate about that because I felt like we were doing good. And I think that we did do good too. I, I don't think it was just, I don't, I don't think that that was nothing. Um, and the people that I worked with, nobody at that company was making a million dollars. The people that at the very top of the company had pretty reasonable salaries. Like it was gen, generally and genuinely a pretty good a collection of good people trying to do good work and also pay their rent the problem is just that because of the system that we operated in it wasn't sustainable in a way that allowed everyone to have a meaningful life and the scariest thing to your point jeff about the change from you know being yourself at home to being an employee is during mm -hmm. that time i had one mode there was no there was no i didn't come home and change I still had free time and I still did things with my free time, but most of my free time was spent with the people that I worked with, who I still think of as very close friends, like several of them I keep in touch with and, and really adore. And um, it was mu very much like we would get done working someplace at 10 o'clock, go to the bar for an hour or two, and there was no difference. I might code switch a bit if I was talking to clients instead of coworkers, but when it was just us coworkers, I mean, I, it was there was no like differentiation between my home life and my work life and i don't think until you're forced out of that the, the way that i was forced out of it was by deciding i wanted to move across the country so i had to get a different job and my new job is a much healthier place um, in a lot of ways to work and i suddenly was working with people who found certain things less professional or whatever which was a roundabout way of making me go like oh when i'm at work i kind of need to tone these things down a little bit and, and definitely code switch for the work day. Um, and that also helped me to redevelop the, like, this is me at work. This is me at home when I'm not working. Uh, but it's, it's hard. It's, 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 a, it's a challenging thing to break. So it's yeah. certainly not meant as criticism, but I think that sometimes when you see going back to sort of the pushback against reporting about labor issues and games, sometimes you see people sort of, I'm trying to choose my words carefully, but I don't want to go super long coming to the defense of developers for a just reason. But it's also like, no, 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 you really need to understand holistically what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Yes. The developers are saying this, but it may not be from a place of full understanding of the situation that they've kind of been manipulated to be in. And it's not right. their fault. It's and also, them, but also I feel like a lot of the times, like the, one of the justifications I see a lot is, oh, well, they chose to do this. It's like they exactly. always chose to do the crunch. And like at my old job, um, like I worked, there are certain periods of time where I worked like a lot of overtime and I was working in the office until like nine and I was miserable, but you know, nobody ever told me to, to, to do that. It was just like the reality of, okay, I need to get this work done somehow. Um, Therefore, you know, it, it, it ended up that way because I was like, well, you know, if I don't do the work, who's going to do the work? I don't like, I felt guilty yeah. about pushing it onto anybody else. So well, it was just like, there's, there's like a lot of factors here that aren't, aren't just some, you know, manager, uh, twirling their mustache going, you must yeah. work here for a 16 hour day. Like that's yeah. not the reality of how it works. And I, I, that's what I think is really valuable about Alex's article is just like, we, we, sh we need to acknowledge the reality while also, you know, saying, yeah. Hey, maybe we could do something differently. To, to your point, Allison, and it, it doesn't always just have to be, I want to get this done. Sometimes it's a case of you're the only one who knows how to do it. Like right. it's the kind of thing where, yep. If you were hit by a bus, someone else wouldn't necessarily know how to pick up where you left off because you oh, have yeah. you have all that context in your head. And I you mean, when I got of laid the... off, I like I specifically sat that day. Like I still like I feel like in hindsight, I wish I would have just kind of been like, okay, bye. When I got laid off, but that day, <laughs> yeah, I that's, that's like that's what I do. I that's I mean, yeah, but you get into that like into that headspace where I was like, oh well, I need to train some people up on this one thing and yeah. otherwise it won't get done. And I'm like, you know, why did I care that much? Because I was like, 
justifiably like not happy with the situation about getting laid off, but I still was like, well, like, like you, you like become not necessarily, you know, feeling bad about the company, but be feeling bad about coworkers and about everything else. And you just like, yeah. so I, I worked like for several more hours that day after I got laid off because I was like, well, I need to train people up on these things that only I know how to do. And it's like, yeah, it's not, it's, that shouldn't be my problem, but it's kind of a, an imbued sense of responsibility that you're just like, yep, right. I, I've got to handle this because no one else can at this point. And right. Um, Nobody else knows the yeah. realities of this client and I'm the only one. And so like I offered to train yeah. people before, but that's, that shouldn't, it shouldn't be my problem. Yeah. But at the yeah. same time, like part yeah. of that's like empathy for other people too. You're like, I don't want someone else to right. suffer through like this nightmare that I can help them avoid. Right. Uh, but, but there's, yeah. I just feel like a lot of, you know, ways that you get kind of stuck in that mindset where you're like, 100%. I have to do this for this company when you're like, really, you don't No. Yeah. Uh, one thing we've mentioned a few times is that like the way that the industry writes about the crunch is like not like addressing the problem and mm -hmm. i think like when they report on it when like a jason schreier or you know someone at waypoint or uh kotaku wherever uh is reporting on this they're all guilty of it too. Like the, the people writing about it, they do the same thing. They crunch, they work long hours. They justify this stuff, whether that's because, you know, Oh, well I have to hit this embargo or mm -hmm. the story, mm -hmm. you know, I really like the story and you know, part and of I that's, think it's important. Oh, they it's didn't like... get, they didn't get the game until, you know, three days before the embargo is up and it's a 40 hour game or whatever. Yeah. Or, or uh, think, you know, think stuff of like that. Think of the classic Jeff Gersman story of getting Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time on like a Friday, playing it literally like 24 hours for yeah. three days and then having a review up on the Monday. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's also challenging because uh, like if you look at a company like Bloomberg, which I mean, I'm not attacking Trier for this, but Bloomberg has had numerous labor issues yeah. across the spectrum of that vice you know, overwork. Uh, yeah. And yeah, vice has as well overwork mm -hmm. and harassment and all this stuff. So it, it's certainly... To some extent, um, the reporting can feel a little bit like uh, Stone's cast from a glass house. Right. But that also doesn't mean we can't that we shouldn't talk about it in reporting. It, on that, so. No, right. no, uh, it, 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 it one hundred percent should be talked about in the reporting. But I think it's easy to like if you're in the exact same situation, it's hard to do that self reflection and realize, yes. oh, this is what's happening because it's happening to you too, and maybe you you start to I'm, like justify the way it's happening to. I would people. say like part of it's because I'm a fanboy, so it's hard for me to be totally impartial. But like at least like some places like Waypoint talks about not yes. all the not every time, but a lot of times they'll bring up like, hey, we overwork sometimes too. And they try to do things to fight against it, like, you know, Patrick Klepek didn't finish Amnesia Rebirth before the embargo date, yeah. et cetera. So there are some places that are trying to do the the work to be better, but even it's hard it's such a nuanced subject that, you know, Alex, you wrote a four thousand word article about it, right? Like it's hard. We've spent 40 minutes talking about it. It's hard to like unpack all of the nuance in that conversation, really in any medium, yeah. because it is so multi-headed yeah. that you can go down. I mean, it, the thing I think about when I think of this is like the image I've had in my head is, you know, those, those pin things you put your hands in and it makes the <laughs> yeah. like 3d image of your hand on the other side. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's what this, that's what this problem is like. And every single one of those pins is, is another aspect of it that in and of itself, you could probably devote hundreds of hours of trying to determine how to solve that problem. So yeah. it's, it's, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to solve it. I'm not being defeatist here, but it certainly is a hard problem to solve. But I think that we need to acknowledge that it's more complicated than Absolutely. just saying don't crunch. Like, it, you it's, know, yes. it's, it's more complicated than saying, Oh, if we delay it six months, that fixes the problem. Right. Like, and I like, think that we need to acknowledge that it's not necessarily just like, you know, that maniacal evil company going ha no. ha 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 like, like, we, like you know like, yeah again, it's more looking, complicated than that yeah like again look at route 59 the makers of necrobarista there was no evil there and they had burnout and they had their own crunch by self-imposed passion basically like because they wanted to make the best thing they possibly could but ended up in kind of the same place so right. like they, they, it's multifaceted there's not one catalyst there's not one answer it's yeah. we need to be more introspective and more critical and more objective and 
to start right. taking things seriously. Yeah. So that's about it. Anyway, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 got delayed to December. Yeah. <laughs> if, there's, if there's one thing that I that I want, like people should take away from this, like other than, hey, crunch is a complex subject, and go read Alex's article. It's, hey, take care of yourself and like yes. recognize when you're working right. too hard and like you know allow yourself time to relax. That is yeah. one thing I've worked like I try to maintain for myself a lot is just like I'm, I can disengage. I'm going to leave on time every day from my job. I'm not going to think about work. Basically when I get home, I'm not going to do anything extra for work. Even if I have to probably. <gasps> oh, and I think also it, Some not, people don't have that luxury, but right. as much as you can, you know, do what and also you can. Don't feel disengage. guilty about taking care of yourself. So, I think that's the biggest thing that like I've had to personally deal with is just that feeling of like, I could be working harder or I could be doing more. Whereas it's like, maybe you technically could, but it's not worth your health. It's not worth your mental health. So, it's also important to keep in mind and then I'll shut up, but everyone has different thresholds. Right. What exactly. That limit is, and you need to be respectful of the people around you's thresholds and understand them as well as your own. And you shouldn't, y your worth is not determined by your labor and your, like your productivity for how much too. labor yeah. and productivity you can produce yeah 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 so um yeah i have one last thought and it's kind of unrelated to the games industry and anything we've actually been talking about um but it is still wholly relevant to the conversation and i feel as though everyone in the world almost at this point can maybe at least start to contextualize what this feeling is like for developers because we're the majority of us are forced to work from home right now uh Students are forced to take classes at home. Teachers are forced to teach from home. Uh, programmers are forced to work from home 100%. You know, like everybody is at home and it's so incredibly difficult to separate your life from your work, which is nice when you're going to an office or a school or drive through that you're operating the, the microphone at, whatever. Um, like once you leave that building, you can turn that part of your brain off and you can yeah. return to your comfy space. You can mm -hmm. have your separate computer, your television, your your kitchen. Like, you know, all of that is your home and you're not thinking about work there. But now this has all been invited into our homes. The same yeah. place we're relaxing is the same place we're spending eight to ten hours a day doing work. And it's a really difficult thing because we do need to learn how to separate our concerns. We do need to say, okay, once it has reached this hour... I'm done. But like a lot of us don't like we say, oh, I could just, you know, I can get back to this. I can finish it later. Right. And like, like, or I can oh, check I had my email this... on my phone while I watch a movie or something. Exactly. And you're like, yeah. 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 Like a lot of us have slack on our phones, like, because that way we're able to check it when we're doing other things. Cause like, that's something we've been conditioned to do. Uh, we have our work email on our phones, like our personal phones that we take with us when we go to watch a movie or whatever. Well, not this year, but uh point point being um, like it's it's difficult to find work-life balance when your mm -hmm. work has entered your life like to yeah. yep, to be blunt and it's it's the same for development it's the same for all of us and we just yeah. need to figure out ways to have self-respect like that's basically it yeah yeah and and i mean my my personal way was always to like leave work at at the office and so yeah like now that like when I was working from home, like that wasn't a thing that I had. I had to constantly kind of fight the, oh, I could check that my laptop and just check my email or just check on my phone or, and it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard because especially if a lot of us have the kind of working in an office mindset, uh, you, you need a whole different skill, uh, like set of skills and set of boundaries to yourself. So. Yeah. And it sucks when you're passionate because yeah. then, you're, yep. then you're just like, oh man, wait, it's 9 p.m. I could do this really fast. Oh, no. anyways, whatever. <laughs> we can we can move on. We've been here yeah. for a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> take care of yourselves, people. <laughs> like, yeah. yep. just take care of don't yourselves. Don't do what Donnie and... don't. <laughs> don't do what Donnie don't here does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Well, uh, speaking of. Uh, uh, 
we're we're long today. I don't know. We'll we should we're gonna just, hit these next uh, news stories real quick. Yeah, we should. You should just go. We'll, no room we'll, for for we'll, comment. We'll rapid, just, we'll rapid fire it. Yeah, just if anyone has any idiots. strong feelings, uh, hit, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. No, no, we just. Far Cry 6 has been delayed until after March 2021 and also, also Rainbow Six quarantine delayed yeah. to sometime before April 2022. Uh, okay. so, hey, crunch, crunch, crunch. Uh, <laughs> Spider-Man Miles Morales had a new suit uh, revealed inspired by... Fucking rad. Looks sick as fuck. Into the Spider-Verse, and it is it is the Miles Morales suit from that movie, and they animated it to look like it's from the movie because that yeah. movie has some crazy animations. You look it up on it's, how they animated it into hell. the Spider-Verse. It is amazing. amazing. Like, it, it's, it's got like the movie frame rate, but only on his yeah. character model. It's great. Yeah, it's yeah. so cool. Spider-Verse in general is just like amazing, let's be honest. Yes. It's, it's the best Spider-Man. It, oh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. One thousand percent. As and someone who doesn't I'm, like comic book movies, hundred <laughs> percent. I I I still think about like like sometimes like occasionally something will pop up on Twitter where it's like, here's how I made the music to Spider Verse, and I'm like, all of you were so talented. I, I've <laughs> watched that movie music. a lot of times. It's probably the Spider Man movie I've watched the most too. Ah uh, sure. man, it's so good, and that suit looks amazing, and I'm excited to play that yep. game. Uh, Halo Infinite's director Chris Lee has left a project, and. They are the second director to leave the project. That game might yeah. never come out. <laughs> that that, that well, thing is a nightmare yeah. project. Halo and Infinite, infinite it will be in is... development forever. <laughs> yeah, that's what infinite I was about to say. development. Yep, Halo <laughs> Infinite development. Just uh, call it Doom Eternal because it's in development hell. Oh wow! Uh, you know what they should do? Also, oh well, yeah, they, they, Alex? they should they should release that game and then iterate on it. That's what they should do. That's that's what they're gonna do. But, but uh, like, yeah, <laughs> put it in early access. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be the, like the Halo for like. Yeah, they got to put out some other big first party stuff first, so that that's not the thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it looks real bad for the Series X launch. Uh, let's see. Speaking of Series X and Microsoft, Everwild creative director Simon Woodruff. Uh, also left Rare, though it doesn't seem like he's shipped a game in a long time. He worked on a lot of stuff at Sega, like Sonic Generations or something. Oh. Uh, and, like, he's, he's been in the industry a long time, but it doesn't seem like he's shipped anything, like, recently. So I'm not even sure what's up there. I don't know. There weren't any major details on what's going on there. Uh, next story, hackers jailbroke the Oculus Quest 2, bypassing the need for a Facebook login, Hell yeah. which I think that's you whole should thing. wait until we see what happens with PSVR for the next gen before buying well, they, the headsets. Jim, Jim Ryan, that's his name, yep. put out a, did an interview with the Washington Post where he said new PSVR is not happening next year or probably the year after that. So. He also said that there would not be PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 cross-gen games. So that guy <laughs> lies all the fucking time. <laughs> that's, that's true. I bet you will see it announced next year. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I just we'll mean wait and see what it is first before you invest yeah. in VR hardware. Uh, yeah. I wonder I wonder if um, Facebook slash Oculus are going to do the Switch thing and fix it with a hardware update with some... Like I bet they will. Release. Yeah. I suspect this won't last. This hack won't last. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Sony. Speaking of Sony, pushed a p series of p pa Sony pushed a series of patches to PS4 games, which reduced loading times. I did not see this story myself. Yeah. W what what games? Like The Last of Us. Um, okay. What were some other ones? Like Bloodborne. No, not Bloodborne. Was it? Probably Ghost of Tsushima. But that had a big patch because it had like it already had great load times multiplayer too for mode. Yeah, that game yeah. being what it is. Yeah, God of yeah. War probably. I don't know. Yeah. Like we they were, believe yeah. in generations. Yeah. Um. Like it was kind of insane how much it was like improving. Like it was a significant uh, okay. improvement. Stuff that was like taking a minute. Like here, The Last of Us remastered. Uh, they used to have loading times that were over a minute and now they are 14 seconds if you optimize your file size and like yeah 
Yeah, th there's a lot of optimization you can do to load times if you know what the hard drive looks Somebody like. Somebody tell Activision, because holy shit, those Call of Duty files. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cold War's like, 250 gigabytes. Yeah, that's that's if you have, like, the full 4K texture stuff. Yeah, yeah. you're right. It's um, only 220 or 225 gigabytes if you don't. It's like, it's like 175, I thought. Yeah, uh, but, but, but Andre, yeah, That's Andre, just the campaign. Andre, one which might interest you is Until Dawn on PS4 now doesn't have load times. Hmm. wow yeah that, like wow <laughs> yeah yeah cool. so it's hmm. insane okay that's actually really cool uh maybe i'll go replay until dawn that'll okay uh next a new entry in the steins gate series was announced hell it's yeah not been titled and there are basically no details yep no they've talked about the fact that like it is not necessarily a sequel it's not necessarily a prequel but it's in the same series okay Looking it's forward a, to whatever that is. It, it's a squeakquel. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Steins Gate, the squeakquel. Get Alvin uh, all yes. up in here. <laughs> Alvin! What's the guy's name? Uh, Dave? Yep. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Alvin, Dave, and a name that starts with an M uh, that is related to chipmunks. Michelangelo. It, <laughs> Alvin, Michelangelo, and Dave announced Put a new Radeon new, GPUs. Their new GPUs. <laughs> In the crossover uh, event of the year. Finally uh, came out swinging against NVIDIA's GPUs and revealed the 6800, the Radeon 6800, the 6800 XT, and the 6900. Nice. 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 Yeah. They're actually pretty great. Which is surprising. Like, uh, Radeon cards have not been particularly excellent. Like, they've been fine. Like, they've been decent. They've been the value option. Like, they're the ones you get that are a little cheaper. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they do their job. They're fine. They're okay. But the drivers are historically really fucking terrible. Like, to the mm -hmm. point where it's, like, almost bricking people's PCs. Like, not to the extent I'm not saying they're bricking people's PCs. But, like... They became... But you're saying sometimes they're bricking people's PCs. Uh, yeah. it, 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 they, they, they may as well until the next like yeah, drive I got comes you. out. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I have um, friends who uh, who who I have in multiple different groups of friends who have built PCs recently, and they were like, "I'm gonna get the AMD option is a little cheaper, and they're better anyway." And I was like, "Okay, you keep telling yourself that." And then they got them, and then had a nightmare trying to get certain yeah. games to work because they're like, "The drivers suck." It turns out, yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah I told you this. Yeah. But, you didn't but listen looks... to me. But it looks like this time they're actually bringing the fire. Like they're bringing the heat. They look they look really good. And I'm not as in like, rage mode. Yeah, rage mode is dumb. It's basically like an overdrive button that makes it go like a little bit 1%, faster. 1%, <laughs> like one percent on difference. the card itself. No, no, it's oh, like a wow. software thing. I want yeah, like, it on like, the card. Yeah, that'd be well, sweet. You have to gonna... reach into your case and just Fuck yeah. poke, poke your card. You could build oh, a custom rage case that has a, uh, has a button. <laughs> problem. Is it only yeah. works in rage? In rage two. Oh. or uh the avengers but it's yeah they seem good um there's a lot more to talk about but we don't have to right now they seem yeah, good uh, and it's the first they, time the gpu space has had competition in they, a long time and they're like actually competing against like the high-end stuff usually they're like yeah. mid to low-end com competitors uh yeah like they would be com like their highest end would be competing against like the 70 series like the 1070 2070 yeah 3070 but yeah. this one like they're actually right up there against the 3080 and 3090 so yeah and cool. cheaper it's pretty cool and, for those and cards, significantly yeah. cheaper like yeah. their 3090 equivalent is 1000 us dollars the 3090 is 1500 us dollars so like yeah it's a big difference but, but we'll see if it's any good uh in a couple in of weeks yeah but yeah that with that i think we can finally wrap up <laughs> <laughs> we lost oh wait okay no i just made my window small that's what happened here okay i was like we lost <laughs> allison and pat but no i just shrunk my window down oh i'm here baby i'm still here after despite everything despite i'm everything. still here it's is, i'm still here dog is despite asleep. despite all this rage mode i'm still just a rat in a cage <laughs> <laughs> the squeak hole <laughs> indeed <laughs> I just Jeff put this in the chat. Teenage Mutant Ninja Alvin. Oh my God. Oh God. Alvin. Teenage You're Mutant welcome. Ninja Alvin. Welcome. 
Thank I, you for that. I yelled when I was Nielsa working. Nielsa Siriega uh, can have that one for free. Yeah. When I was working at <laughs> food service, I, there was a guy named Alvin came through, and I've, we had to like yell out people's like, names for their order. And oh so God! I like, yeah. I, I looked at my supervisors like I'm just gonna like yell Alvin like Alvin and Chipmunks, and she's like okay <laughs> i did it and everyone in the venue just turned and stared at me <laughs> then he came back like two weeks later and he's like you can do it <laughs> <laughs> he was looking at, like i looked down and i saw his name and i looked up and we made eye contact he's like do it <laughs> <laughs> okay that's good because i, I think if you said your name's oh, alvin yeah. you've heard that way too much but if he's oh. like on board then that's good the way you hey. said do it just made me think of the horse from yeah. oh yeah metal no he said it just like uh Kiefer sutherland and metal gear do it uh, uh that... palpatine <laughs> that works too do, do it. it execute <laughs> order <laughs> alvin god this is where we are today yeah it's been oh, a long yeah. this hey. is been like... a good morning this is a long podcast and i'm just like yeah that has been episode 145 of the gaming fix podcast on october 31st 2020 i've been your host andre cole aka your partner's favorite ghoul uh you can find the podcast on twitter at gaming fix or at fix podcast oh god it's late i lost it oh no at fix podcast on twitter uh at fix.space where you can read alex's excellent article or you can go over to podchaser.com slash gaming fix leave us a review it'd be very much appreciated and i think i think that's everything for the, the podcast stuff you can find me andre cole <laughs> On Twitter at Coolslaw, C O O L S L four W. Pat, where can people find you? Find me at PJC Plays, and you can find me flying airplanes uh, next Saturday for twenty four hours Yay! around yeah. the world. Bow, 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 bow. Uh, it should be I'm so interesting. Excited. It's going to be especially cool. interesting trying to manage that with the whole dog situation. So I'm excited <laughs> to find a solution. Yeah, for that. those planes they fly themselves. They do kind of these days. Um, so uh yeah that'll be that'll be interesting uh we'll try be and details on how you can get in on that from the donation perspective if you have the means to donate um but also just want people to come and hang out and share that we're doing it and maybe we'll get some other like uh stuff going in on the side yes, that'd be like great you know get some among us going or uh, yeah i'll be streaming to the to the fixed channel but there's going to be plenty of long periods of time where we can switch over to another game and it turns out trans pacific transatlantic flights really long yeah yep. and we're probably gonna have it. to use a little bit of time dilation to get it all to work but uh that doesn't mean that it'll be fun to watch the ocean zip by <laughs> allison where can people find you me on twitter at w-r-i-t-e-r-s-e-r-e-n-y-t-y jeff you can find me on Twitter uh, at Stranger Peace. That's P-E-A-C-E, uh, where you can see all of my word vomit. Yum. <laughs> word yep. vomit. Yum. <laughs> wow. I... Okay. And Alex, where can people find you? I'm still thinking about gourds. I didn't know that zucchini was a gourd. Is it? Huh? Okay. Yeah, I read something about how, like, pumpkins in certain parts of Asia are like just just mean gourd. So like, yep. Basically, if you say, "Are you carving pumpkins?" It's like, "Are you carving any gourd?" So you get like, <laughs> I don't know. It's in Japan, huh. they don't like old people. They didn't have a word for green, so they just say blue. So yeah. they're like, the light's blue. And they do, yeah. Wow, I love it. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. <laughs> or like, That's if you're talking about it, like, like a banana, it's like, oh, it's too blue. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's cool. Like they had a word for green, but they just don't. They just said it was blue. I just, I don't. It's an inherently colorblind culture. But only for green. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's Anyways. gonna do it. 
thanks for joining us on thanks this for very special podcast thanks for joining jeff as always we always appreciate Yay, it Hey, thank you jeff and thank okay. you jeff for the Tell excellent me. yes thank you for the excellent theme we love it yeah yes I'm sure our listeners love it mm -hmm. yeah it's awesome I'm, I'm, I'm just glad people enjoy it look up the gif of cat jam and that's what they're doing every time we start the podcast Aww. <laughs> goodbye everybody <laughs> goodbye goodbye y'all